خوبه؟ این میکروفون چی باشه؟ روشن باشه؟ آره بعد In the name of God, uh, good afternoon to all. In the name of God, good afternoon to all uh, uh, colleagues and uh, students. Uh, we start the antibiotic resistance panel just now. Uh, before starting the panel, first of all, I would like to thank from the organizer of the webinar, Professor Faisal Badi, head of Microbiology Society, and the scientific uh, secretary, and also executive teams, especially Dr. Abdullah and his teams, for holding this uh, uh, virtual webinar in this uh, difficult situation, COVID-19. I know that it's very difficult for uh, holding this uh, webinar. Uh, our first uh, uh, that uh, uh, accept our invitation and we are very happy to have this uh, uh, two professors in our panel. Also, I would like to thank from uh, Dr. Fatima Kalim from Pakistan and also my colleagues, uh, Dr. Muhammad Riza Saleh from the Tehran University of Medical Sciences, uh, Imam Khomeini Hospital, and also from Dr. Farzad Badmasti from Pastor Institute of, of Iran. Uh, first, uh, the first uh, speaker is Professor Joseph Ani. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, you, Professor, in our panel. Professor Joseph Ani is from Department of Microbiology and Immunology, Rega Institute for Medical Research, Faculty of Medicine from Belgium. He is talking about new targets in the fight against resistance bacteria. Professor uh, Joseph Ane is a member board of uh, uh, FEMS Society and also is a editorial board of uh, several journals uh, such as uh, Future Microbiology. Uh, dear Professor, would you please start your uh, lecture? Thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation, which gives me the opportunity uh, to speak about our work, uh, which has been done in the past and is still going on. And um, it's also nice to be uh, in Tehran, at least uh, online. Uh, I remember two meetings I was before, I was uh, in Ardabil. Uh, in 2012 and in Tehran 2013 for the same event, in fact. Um, but now I will talk about the topic I am working on and I will share now the... ...presentation. Okay, so it's about new targets in the fight against drug-resistant bacteria. And as you know, it's a big problem, the antimicrobial resistance, which occurs everywhere in the world, in some places more than in others. Uh, but <clears throat> it also means that there's a real threat of infectious diseases. Uh, I'm so sorry, Professor. Could you full screen your slides? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so it's really a, glo uh, a global threat, and as a consequence of that, there are already several action plans. One of those one uh, is global action plan on antimicrobial resistance, and the idea is to ensure uh, for as long as possible, that um, 
infectious diseases should be under control. It was also mentioned before already in 2017, uh, as you probably know that there's a priority pathogens list for research and development for new antibiotics, which are categorized in three uh, priority lists, critical, which means that those are very important and give many problems in the clinics. Uh, which also means uh, that in some places this is hardly treatable anymore. And uh, to give an example of that, it's about European Center for the Disease Control. If you look for uh, Acinetobacter and uh, the resistance against carbapenems, um, in green it's quite, it's quite well, but if you see further, uh, if you go more south and east, uh, it's a really a big problem. Uh, just to indicate, uh, in Greece, about more than 90% of the uh, acinetobacter are not treatable anymore with uh, car carbapenems, an uh, often used antibiotic. And it's also depend a bit, uh, as you see, in northern countries and western countries, it's far less a problem. Uh, that's also because of the way the description of the antibiotics is done by the medical uh, doctors, how easily it can be obtained and also uh, the importance of politics on that. Uh, just recently, um, also addressing the crisis in antibiotic development, uh, in, in July this year, uh, more than 20 leading uh, pharma companies have now launched a fund looking for new antibiotics and they hope to find two to four new treatments for patients uh, in 2030, which might be optimistic. When don't, one doesn't know, of course. Uh, because if you look further on, uh, one forecast that in 2050, if there are new no new antibiotics are coming, that uh, more people will die from infectious diseases than from uh, cancer. And the reason for that is so there's a lot of resistance and there's a very big pipeline. At the moment, there are 60 products in development, 50 antibiotics, which are almost all, in fact, variations, chemical modifications of existing antibiotics and some new biologics, for example, monoclonal antibodies, which can be, which are now under development. Uh, why is this problem? Because there's a major disinterest by major drug companies. Uh, the reason for that is um, they don't get, uh, they don't gain money of that uh, because they are more looking to, um, to more chronic diseases where well, they can use for a long time that antibiotic. If they find a new antibiotic, uh, they cannot be used uh, because it should be a reserve antibiotic. So the market is... Um, so the last new antibiotic uh, was uh, developed, in fact, in 1987. Uh, so that's a long time ago. There's only one very recent one, which was in fact developed in Belgium. Uh, that's Bedaculin, which is an ATP synthetase uh, inhibitor, which is used, now, which can now be used for mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, so the reason why companies are not interested anymore is because the market uh, is very cost intensive to bring the uh, compounds on the market. As a consequence of that, new discoveries for antibiotics are done in small companies, uh, research institutes and universities. The problem of resistance is also one is always using the same targets. Um, and new targets are urgently needed. Uh, I happen to explain which are the classical targets, cell wall, uh, so the inhibition of cell wall, the nascent synthesis inhibition, RNA synthesis inhibition, plasma membrane ribosomes, so the inhibition of protein biosynthesis and metabolic pathways. But 
the, the problem of this is that they all give resistance sooner or later. Just to give a small example, um, penicillin discovered in 1928, uh, came on the market in 1944-45, and the first resistance was already there in uh, 40, 1947. Another example is me, uh, methicillin discovery, and uh, it's in for, uh, 58, but in 68 you have already resistance against that. And we can continue with that. Uh, as a last example, we have uh, daptomycin discovered 87, uh, came on the market in 2003, but already resistance in 2004. So in general, from going on the market, the first resistance is an average about eight years later. And for that, it's important to find new antibi antibiotic targets, uh, which are di totally different from what is now on the market to avoid more uh, resistant development. So what is now an interesting new antibiotic target? First of all, it should be essential, conserved, universal, means that it can be used for many different bacteria, so that it can be a broad um, Growth range antibiotic. Uh, it's also possible to have a target which is not essential for growth. Um, that's not real, a real antibiotic, but it focuses on virulence. And as such, uh, it will not develop resistance and it will weaken the bacteria, which can be then removed possibly by the immune system. Of course, the, the target should be sufficiently different from that of humans or it should be of course not as essential in humans. Also the cellular localization is important because if the antibiotic has to reach the cell and to go into the cell it's best when it's on the uh, surface so that it's easily um, reachable. Um, and it's also best if I look for new antibiotics or new compounds that it should be amenable for high throughput screens. And uh, which are possible new targets? Um, targets from the protein secretion pathway. Um, we have several there, the general secretion pathway, the twin arginine translocation pathway, and the type three secretion system. And I will focus on that. But for completeness, uh, there's also work done on the FTZ, uh, FTZ inhibitors, FTZ, which is a GTPase active filament, which is important um, for the cell division. Uh, other alternatives which are uh, now going on is uh, bacteriophage therapy, as you probably know, bacteriophage, which already exists for a very long time, uh, because it's after the detection of bacteriophages, soon after that, um, the Bacteriophage Therapy Institute in Belize, in Georgia, uh, was heavily involved and is still involved uh, in that. And in some cases now, also in Western countries or in the industrialized countries, Bacteriophage Therapy is uh, gaining uh, field. But the possibilities are phage-derived enzymes, uh, which is not really an antibiotic, but can help to um, that antibiotics are becoming more easily taken up by the cell, for example, polysaccharide depolymerases or, or peptidoglycan degrading enzymes, as such the antibiotic can go more easily into the cell. Other possibilities are antibacterial, antibacterial monoclonal antibodies or microbiome therapy. Uh, microbiome therapy um, so uh, in some cases, one can do fecal transplantation to get a more um, healthy, um, uh, good microbiome. But I will focus on the uh, possibilities in uh, the uh, protein secretion pathway. I don't know uh, how much you are expert in that, but uh, I will very briefly explain uh, how the secretion pathway works. Uh, first of all, it starts from the ribosome, of course, and proteins which have to be secreted. Uh, 
have att- attacked with the cyclopeptide. The cyclopeptide, which consists of, a, uh, which is at the, at the end terminal end, and at the end of the cyclopeptide, we have a cyclopeptidase cleavage recognition site. So the proteins uh, comes from the ribosome will be bound to a uh, post-translation interacting uh, protein, for example, in E. coli is that cell B, also other chaperones can be involved, and then they will be transported to, sec A, to the sec translocon. The sec translocon, which consists of sec A, which is a dimer, and has ATPase activity, important to bring the uh, protein to be secreted across the uh, sec translocon, which consists of sec Y, E, and G, and can be held by sec D, F, which gives them protein motive force. But the most important energy comes from sec A, uh, from ATP to ADP. And as such, the protein will be translocated across the uh, membrane. Uh, the protein has, to, of course, to be freed from the signal peptide, uh, peptides, and therefore the signal peptidase will cleave off the signal peptide. And as such, the protein becomes free and get its mature uh, form. Uh, the second, so we have two important factors here, that's the signal peptidase, signal peptidase, which is essential for the cleavage of the signal peptide and is also uh, as such essential because if you block the signal peptidase, the cell will die. This is quite logic because about 30% or more than 30% of all proteins which are produced are secreted. And if you block the secretion, the cell uh, will die. Um, so for that, the signal peptidase is an attractive, or is considered an attractive drug target because it's ubiquitous, so it means all bacteria have the signal peptidase. It's essential because if you block it, I just uh, uh, said it, the cell will die. Uh, it's also different from the classical serine proteases because in this case, um, it, has an, uh, it has a serine lysine catalytic uh, diet instead of a, a triad, which is the classical one. It's also completely different from eukaryotes and it is quite accessible because if you see here, um, that's the membrane, and this is the outer side, is the outer side of the membrane. The uh, active side, uh, the serine and lysine, are at the outer side of the membrane. So it means it's much more accessible. So it has not to go across the uh, inner membrane. Uh, currently, there are so a number of um, signal peptidase inhibitors which are already described now. Um, most of, so there are two uh, secondary metabolites, arylomycin, on which is much, most work has been done. It's uh, produced by streptomyces, uh, Fredier, also chrysanomycin uh, is also a secondary metabolite. And those, uh, certainly arylomycin family, is very well studied so far. There are also different other compounds, uh, chemical compounds, uh, a beta-lactam derivative, uh, a peptide, peptide substrate mimics, and an amino ketone, uh, which are also, um, will also interact with the signal peptidase and block signal peptidase activity. Just to focus uh, a bit on the uh, arylomycin, um, there you can see uh, a first derivative with resistance to all of those bacterial species, but if you modify it, you get very interesting uh, MIC values. Um, if you look also for uh, bacteria which are resistant against a number of antibiotics, 
as shown here for Lapsiella pneumoniae. Um, it's quite resistant against all those antibiotics, but it's sensitive to arginomycin. So this here, arginomycin is a, uh, is a chemical modified arginomycin of the original compound. Um, how does it work now, in fact? So this is the, uh, the crystal structure of the signal peptidase, and you can see three different signal peptidase inhibitors. Yeah, the uh, PNM inhibitor here in blue, and the uh, beta siltan inhibitor in yellow, and here the arginomycin uh, in uh, ma magenta. And here is the active site. So the antibiotics really interact at the active site. Uh, most interesting, you can see here, is because the water molecules are important for the uh, transfer of the taken up from uh, hydroxyl or uh, hydrogen is here displaced by arginomycin, and this is water molecule is displaced by the beta uh, sultan. The rest, or there was a problem with the arginomycin because here this is a part of the arginomycin and this is interaction with the um, signal peptidase. But when there is a prolin, which one found in several one, uh, signal peptidase, one can make this, one can see this now because of many uh, signal peptidases have been sequenced. Uh, is there is a prolin, you don't have in, in any interaction anymore with the, uh, uh, with the arginomycin, but when has now made modifications so that it's possible that it is becoming a broad spectrum antibiotic. Uh, how can one now screen for signal peptidase inhibitors? There are several possibilities for that. Uh, first of all, one can downregulate the signal peptidase expression, and as such, um, the cell becomes more sensitive. And then one has a number of uh, reporter proteins which are secreted and which can be easily uh, measured. Another possibility is with the uh, FRET assay, the fluorescence resonance energy transfer assay, using um, a quen signal pep peptide fragment, as I will explain in a moment. So, in this case, uh, what happens? How does it work, in fact? So, one makes or synthesize a peptide, a small peptide, which also contains the uh, signal peptidase uh, cleavage site, which is located near alanine and other uh, amino acid, and again alanine. So, with um, a quenched molecule, a molecule, uh, what does it mean, a quenched molecule? Um, uh, it means that edans is, um, is uh, gives fluorescence, but it's now quenched by depth seal, which is which is often used. So as long as the protein is uh, the peptide is not cleaved, uh, there is no fluorescence signal. But when the protein is cleaved, one has the uh, fluorescence signal. Um, and just to show that it works, um, this has been done with arginomycin, um, and arginomycin, either the peptide on its own, or the peptide with the signal peptidase here of Staphylococcus aureus, if it's uh, with Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus aureus signal peptidase and the peptide, you see the increase in fluorescence. If this uh, signal, the peptide is not uh, cleaved, then there is no fluorescence signal. As such, one can easily do an um, eye-throughput screening system. 
just to show us uh, an example of this, uh, which we did in the laboratory, uh, looking for new interesting small molecules. We skinned about uh, a bit less than 30,000 molecules and only three give some uh, interesting uh, activities so that the signal peptidase was not, not cleaved anymore at a certain concentration. Um, so this was done with three, four different molecules and the peptide aldehyde, which was um, engineered, uh, chemically synthesized, uh, gave the best results. Uh, as you can see here, there's the signal. Uh, the peptide al uh, aldehyde, you see, it is blocking sooner the uh, signal peptidase activity. However, testing this in in vivo, no antibacterial activity uh, was was found. So one has to do much more uh, screening to find an interesting molecule. Uh, as I just mentioned, we have the peptide alde aldehyde, which also inhibit the uh, signal peptidase. Um, the signal peptidase was in fact, or the uh, peptide aldehyde was designed first on the activity of beta-lactam uh, uh, compounds and then further modified. Uh, it was shown that the uh, lipid tail is necessary for the activity, as you can see in compound two, which is without the uh, lipid uh, peptide, if no activity at all. And by further modification, one could really find which is, the, which is really needed to keep activity. And as such, we found that this decanoyl uh, aldehyde gives uh, some activity uh, for, for IC50, for our various signal peptidase was quite uh, low. It means uh, only 0.09 micromole was, was, was enough to have uh, signal peptidase inhibiting activity. But looking to the MIC values, uh, it is, remains quite high. 125 uh, microgram was needed. So that's for the signal peptidase inhibitors. So it really shows that signal peptidase are a good or can be a good target for inhibiting the uh, protein secretion pathway and as such uh, inhibiting uh, the growth of the bacteria, gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. The other compound which is important in the secretion pathway is the sec -A, as I already explained, that you sec -A, which is a dimer, which gives uh, the energy by hydrolyzing the ATP, uh, ATP uh, and as such giving the necessary energy to uh, bring the uh, signal, uh, the prey protein or the protein across the membrane. Sake also present in gram positive and gram negative bacteria, highly conserved, no homologs, homologs in eukaryotic cells. It has several, uh, there are several functional assays available to find the intrinsic, the membrane or translocation activity. So for translocation activity, Activity, it means that the amount of ATPase is quite high so that you find a lot of phosphate afterwards. And can also use the pre-protein translocation activity as it means that one look for the translocation of the pre-protein. And finally, it's also possible to have fragment-based assay. Um, so for the sake screening assay, one can use ATPs activity in the various forms, as I explained, ion ch channel activity, uh, protein translocation, 
and efficacy of really inhibiting bacterial growth as such. I can do that in vitro and in vivo. Uh, I will not go in details here, but I will show it with uh, a few slides. And then finally, one can also use the fragment-based drug discovery. Um, that's a virtual ligand uh, screening. So one can screen a, in silico, screen a large number of uh, small molecules. Uh, we did about uh, 800,000 uh, from commercial available uh, compounds and see whether they are drinkable in uh, Staphylococcus aureus sec A. The next step is then uh, to go further, which compounds can be interesting and to be used further to go for drinkable compounds. And then of course, one has to look further to the physical chemical pro properties of the molecule. So uh, the administration, the distribution, the, meta the uh, metabolism and excretion, and also to see whether uh, about toxicity. And then from those filtered compounds, one can look to a small number of molecules whether they are, can be docked in the active site of the sec -A. And the sec uh, top score molecules can then be ordered and tested in vitro. I can also look for, uh, look for ATPase activity, which can be easily done by uh, looking so sec -A hydrolyzes ATP to ADP with releasing a phosphate and the phosphate uh, can easily be assessed or quantified with the malachite uh, green and as such one can, as I already explained, the intrinsic membrane or translocation ATPase activity. Just to explain briefly here the translocation, uh, how does it work in fact for the ATP hydrolysis one uses uh, sec A of E. coli in this, in this case, and tested with different uh, various inhibitors at different concentrations, and look then using the malachite green uh, method, as such one can do uh, that in very, uh, very easily in a robotic system to have uh, high screening uh, activity. Um, the translocation activity assay, which is a bit more complicated, uh, how what does one do it? Uh, so one first make uh, liposomes. Um, so liposomes are in fact the membranes in which you have the sec Y, E, and G, which are the translocon. Uh, next, one at sec A, uh, in this case again from Staphylococcus aureus and pre-protein and ATP. And after incubation, one can see whether the pre-protein is inserted in the uh, liposome. How can one test this? Uh, just by removing, uh, by adding proteinase K, proteinase K, which will then be degrade all the proteins outside uh, the cell and then one can uh, further do uh, yeah do the uh, ECA precipitation and identify the uh, pre-protein by using western uh, blotting so it's a quite complicated system uh, in this case of course one cannot do high throughput uh, screening system so how many sec inhibitors are there now? So uh, in, in the literature, one finds about seven different compounds uh, which are active, uh, really sec inhibitors. Um, so that's for the uh, general secretion pathway, the se uh, general secretion pathway, which in fact uh, secrete proteins on the pre-protein to the uh, out, outside of the cell, which is essential as I already explained. 
Another pathway is the twin arginine trans translocation pathway. The twin arginine translocation pathway, completely different from the SEC pathway, in this case, uh, one of two or three different uh, proteins in the membrane, that A, B, and C. And in this case, the protein is already folded inside. For the SEC A, the general secretion pathway, the proteins are not yet folded inside, but get their mature form outside of the cell. In this case, so, um, and the energy is given by the proton motive force. A number of different pathogenic bacteria have also the twin arginine translocation pathway. And the idea is, um, so different proteins, also proteins which give virulence to the bacteria, for example, in E. coli uh, or hemophilus, uh, on this area, um, they give our virulence factors. And if one block the virus, if you one put the twin arginine translocation pathway, the virulence factors cannot be secreted anymore. In this case, it's not really an antibiotic because the cell will survive because the that pathway is not essential. But as such, it inhibit the translocation of virulence factors. And one is looking now for compounds which can block the twin arginine translocation pathway. Uh, several laboratories are looking for that, but so far there's no real um, molecule found which is efficiently blocking the twin arginine translocation pathway. Another pathway is the type 3 secretion pathway, also very important. That type 3 secretion pathway, which is completely different from the SEC pathway, from the twin arginine translocation pathway. And how, is this, how does it work here? So it's a quite complex system, and it's only found in gram-negative bacteria. Uh, it forms some kinds of uh, syringe, in fact, by which proteins from inside the cell immediately were, uh, are secreted into the host cell. And uh, this type 3 secretion pathway is not essential, but also in this case, it's many different toxin or virulence factors are secreted via the, via the type 3 secretion pathway, uh, which gives rise to tissue destruction, inflammation, for example, uh, for E. coli, destruction of the immune response. And if I give you a very short overview of certain imported pathogens, one C, uh, Bordetella, uh, Chlamydia, Enteropathogenic E. coli, Pseudomonas, etc., etc. We saw give different kinds of uh, um, diseases. So if one can block this type 3 secretion pathway, uh, it's possible to make the virulent um, strain avirulent. And as such, the uh, immune system it could help them to, or, uh, or in combination with antibiotics, can help to uh, remove the pathogens. So the type 3 secretion pathway inhibitors is a highly active research area at the moment. There are many different and diverse compounds which are, uh, which are active. Uh, mode of action of these inhibitors is so far not known. And uh, there are several new approaches to develop high throughput screening system because of course this is also important to find enough compounds which are active or can be active. So, as such, we can conclude that urgently, as you certainly know, uh, there's a need for new antibiotics with novel mode of access to avoid uh, cross-resistance against, uh, with the current antibiotics. Uh, I've shown, I hope I have shown you uh, that interfering with the protein secretion pathway can be a valuable approach to find interesting targets.
so far there are no clinical compounds on the market so far but aginomycin is the best far, uh, as far as progressed and uh, can certainly in a short period of time be tested in the clinic but many more research is still needed to bring such inhibitors on the market so with this i hope i give a short overview of what is possible uh, with some new targets and i thank you for your attention Dear Professor, thank you very much for your perfect and interesting uh, lecture. Uh, uh, audience, do you have any question, everyone? Professor, please, over. do you have a question? Is there any question? Uh, hello, Professor. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I would like to ask your comments uh, on the situation of COVID-19 in relation to emerging of resistance among population of bacteria. As you know, uh, the bacterial usage has increased from the first day of COVID-19 in some countries, including my country, for example, mm -hmm. they, they, are, uh, they were using a lot of azithromycin, cephalosporin generations. Uh, so uh, we are not sure uh, at the beginning what's going on now. Uh, my colleagues trying to find uh, the rise in consumption of antibiotics and the problem with uh, the drug resistance. This is the uh, first question. And uh, uh, about uh, making antibiotics or new antibiotics, the rate of progress is very, very slow, mm -hmm. comparing to the last decades, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, now we are facing with new problems, and this is viruses, for example, such as COVID-19, and mm -hmm. it is argument all the days uh, uh, in all countries about what antiviral agents is available whether we have any options to treat the viral disease uh, in terms of coronavirus. If you have uh, comments in uh, this subject also, I appreciate Thank you. Uh, first of all, indeed, uh, now with COVID-19, COVID which is also a problem in Belgium and uh, a again a raising problem in Belgium, also there antibiotics are, be are being used, but uh, it's only used for people uh, for patients which are have COVID-19 which is not a very high number compared to the total population and as such I think um, at least in Belgium I would say it's not really a problem and I don't think it's much look to that in that at, at the moment but of course I agree with you the more antibiotics you use the more resistance there will be appear, that's for sure. I don't know whether this answer your question to some extent. Or... Okay, thank you. And then, yeah, concerning antivirals, availability of antivirals at the moment, there's no antiviral on the market which is active against uh, the SARS. Um, or corona uh, virus. When there's a lot of research, maybe also in Iran, I don't know. Um, yeah, there's only one remdesivir which is produced by Gilead, uh, which is produced by Gilead, but it's not yet available in Belgium. I think it, at the moment it's only available in the US. Uh, but one is looking also to get remdesivir, which decreases to some extent it will not really uh, diminish the infection as such but seems to have some positive impact on the COVID-19 and um, so it has been used in the US quite a lot 
and one hope to use it also in in Europe. And then I also can say that uh, one is looking for vaccines also even in the Rega Institute because in the Rega Institute uh, where I'm belonging to uh, there's a large group working on antivirals uh, between workers one of the best salt and active anti-HIV compounds was developed partly in the Rega Institute and one is looking now also to find new compounds against COVID-19 and one is also trying to develop a vaccine one of the many vaccines one is trying to develop at the moment. Uh, one is looking for the active compounds and also in Europe and Belgium, one is trying to get part of the uh, vaccines which will become available. And there, there will be a priority. So uh, people working in the medical area will be the first when the uh, vaccine becomes available, the first which will be, uh, in, will, will, we will be treated and then elderly people are the second ones which will. But at the moment, uh, it's still a lot of discussion going on, which methods are the best to, um, to try to avoid uh, uh, infected with uh, the COVID-19 virus. Also, certainly every day in the news, one is counting the number of newly infected people, and uh, which is now very important because uh, in two weeks from now, the schools will open. And one uh, is very eager, uh, now one will start with all schools, which will open at the moment, uh, but uh, one is also focusing on more to go online, as was uh, before the holidays as well. So, but here it's also a big problem. Uh, I, I have read also in Iran, it's a, it's a big problem. I don't know how much uh, it's under control uh, here. Uh, we are in the, in the second wave, but the second wave is going down a bit uh, now again. Hello, one of our colleagues asked, uh, should we expect a surge in antimicrobial resistance in or after this pandemic? Is it something we should be concerned about across the global? It is a question I think uh, is the similar with the uh, question of Professor Fezawadi. Could you please explain short? Thank you very much. Okay. You asked the question to who? Yes. Sorry. I didn't get. I didn't get the question because uh, the first. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't get the question. If if the question was for me. Uh, dear professor, I'm sorry to interrupt again. Uh, it was uh, the question of one of our uh, participants that uh, Dr. Shah Shirari uh, just explained. Mm -hmm. uh, should I read the question again? Yeah, because I don't hear anything about that. I, I'm sorry, could you repeat? I, I didn't understand the question. I don't hear. Uh, I do not have your voice. I. I don't. I didn't understand the question because most of it. Okay. Uh, 
one of our participants asked that should we expect a surge in antimicrobial resistance after this pandemic? Is it something we should be concerned about across the globe? Uh, I, I think indeed the more antibiotics one uses, the more chances to have antimicrobial resistance. And one should really take care of that. Did you get it? Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much for your uh, interesting uh, uh, presentation. Thank you very much again for uh, acceptance our invitation. The second speaker is uh, Professor Christian Giske. He uh, is talking about uh, phenotypic antimicrobial susceptibility testing state of the art. Uh, uh, Christian Giske is the head of microbiology at Division of Clinical Microbiology, Kalinska Institute, and chief consultant physician in bacteriology, mycology, and microbacteriology at Kalinska University Hospital in uh, Sweden. It's our pleasure to have a professor in this uh, webinar. Uh, professor Giske uh, have the Euro Life Medal following his uh, Euro Life Distinguished Lecture on Antimicrobial Resistance. Dear Professor, would you please start your uh, lecture? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, the kind introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, participate uh, in this session uh, with the talk as uh, introduced here phenotypic antimicrobial susceptibility testing state of the art. Um, and I'm doing this talk as the chair of the European Committee on Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing, but I will try to focus a little bit broader than that, but still target many of the activities that are ongoing there since they are largely overlapping with what's uh, news uh, in this field. So, um, if we start with uh, a brief introduction into the area of uh, phenotypic uh, antimicrobial susceptibility testing, uh, it all comes down to um, the paradigm of uh, killing of bacteria, or as we call it, pharmacodynamics, uh, in the specific case of uh, antimicrobials is a balance between uh, the pharmacokinetics, uh, that would be the way the drug uh, would be um, um, processed uh, and excreted from the body and hence the amount that you have available for bacterial killing uh, in balance with uh, the minimal inhibitory concentration uh, of uh, the uh, concrete bacteria in question that you're trying to, to kill. So this is largely what um, all um, antimicrobial susceptibility testing committees uh, globally um, focus on as uh, a main uh, hypothesis of how this is, uh, this is ongoing. And this is also why uh, we can uh, utilize uh, pharmacokinetics and dynamics uh, to a large extent uh, when we try to establish which bacteria are susceptible to, to novel drugs. Uh, and of course, we have the susceptibility testing as an important method of that. Uh, the minimal inhibitory uh, concentration testing is in the simplest form, uh, a fairly uncomplicated business where you can look for the first well with no growth in a micro titer plate like this. But obviously, it takes a lot of effort to get this right. You need to ensure that you have the right concentrations that uh, shelf life uh, aspects are respected. And in some cases for some bacteria, you need to add uh, certain additives to promote the bacterial growth. And also for some bacteria, uh, this method is not really the reference method, but rather for instance, agar dilution could be the, uh, the reference method. But it, it, in most cases one can establish min, uh, minimal inhibitory concentrations. And this is a very important uh, first step in all AST. But as we will show, uh, there are also other ways of achieving um, uh, this kind of, of data that we need. So 
once you get the value and you have done this in, in a perfectly correct way, you have to ask yourself, what does the value mean? Uh, and how can you tell whether it's susceptible or resistant? And that also comes back to how can you use it in patient management? Uh, can you, for instance, integrate the information with information on plasma concentrations of antimicrobials? It's increasingly um, uh, feasible to get the information on plasma concentration of antimicrobials since the field of clinical pharmacology has largely advanced this area with very precise methods for measuring uh, plasma concentrations. And the question is, how does it all relate uh, to the values we can measure? And the simple solution of it is uh, to use so-called uh, breakpoints. And they are cutoff values that are used to separate between susceptible or uh, the category which was previously called intermediate, but is now by UCAS called susceptible increased exposure, and finally resistant. Uh, the breakpoints, which are also sometimes referred to as critical concentrations, are the values separating, and it could look something like S less than or equal to two, R more than eight, and then based on the measurement, you will either get it in the S, I, or R category, depending on which value uh, you actually used. So these are the basics, and this is what you will find in tables, and this is no different in tables that are produced by UCAST or by the US counterpart, which is called the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute. Uh, so the question is, uh, how does one um, arrive at these values? Um, how can you say that this value is reasonable and another value is not? And the question, uh, this comes back to a long discussion where we for decades had national breakpoint committees that set breakpoints. Uh, so these are examples of the breakpoint uh, committees that were in place prior to uh, UCAST. Uh, so uh, all of them were setting their own breakpoints um, uh, for uh, different uh, bacterial and microbial combinations. And the only thing that's certain is that this was a time of disagreement. Uh, amoxicillin, cefotaxim, and piperacillin tazobactam some pretty important, clinically important drugs, all of them, um, against uh, Enterobacterialis. And you can see that uh, mostly committees were in disagreement about what the values should be. So this was what we came from. And when people referred to susceptibility in papers, you had to think about which system they were using, because depending on which uh, uh, definitions you were using, you would obviously end up with completely different uh, susceptibility rates or resistance rates, if you like. So as of today, uh, this has been simplified. Uh, so we have uh, UCAST, which is chaired by myself, setting uh, breakpoints on behalf of the European Medicines Agency for Europe from the start, but also uh, uh, over time in a number of other places. Even in the US, um, there are users in Canada, um, mostly um, using UCAST, Australia. Brazil has also recently uh, switched to UCAST system and China also has uh, a lot of activities in this um, regard. In, CL, uh, in um, uh, the North America, uh, CLSI, uh, chaired by Mel Weinstein, is uh, setting breakpoints for US, but also obviously used extensively internationally. And then the Food and Drug Administration are setting breakpoints uh, for the US only. Uh, sometimes they are the same as the CLSI breakpoints, but not necessarily. To complicate things, they can also be different. Uh, so, uh, what has happened is that um, UCAST has become um, a global committee, and this is uh, traditionally we were using uh, a, a European map and then adding uh, countries outside of Europe at the bottom of this map to show the percentage of laboratories which were using the UCAST system. But this is gradually shifting, 
and we are moving more and more into essentially a world map uh, in terms of, of the catchment areas um, and obviously many of the other that are not mentioned here would use uh, the CLSI system mostly unless they have their own uh, system in place which can occasionally also be true. So uh, in terms of uh, the UK system um, and what would one could say about um, uh, what the advantages are over another system, one of them is that the documents are completely available free of charge. Any document can be downloaded and they are also translated to multiple languages. If uh, a certain country wants to translate the document, we would provide the original document in English, for instance, and then uh, we would uh, endorse that that can be freely used to translate it. So recently, for instance, uh, a colleague from Syria was translating the UK uh, um, documents to, um, to Arabic, and there are also lots of other, we have translations in Chinese and lots of, of, of different languages. Another point to this is that the industry, um, uh, that is the pharmaceutical industry, is not part of the decision process. So all uh, decisions about susceptibility are taken only by um, professionals uh, who are dedicated to antimicrobial susceptibility testing. There is also a transparency into the decision process. Those factors I mentioned initially with pharmacokinetics and dynamics and MIC distributions are thoroughly described in rationale documents where you can see why a certain value was selected. And this means it's actually possible to, to get that information if you are interested. If you are not interested, you can just use the values, but in theory, you can obtain insight into how the decision was made. And there are also some other uh, news, which I will mention also later on, such as the introduction of rapid antimicrobial susceptibility testing based on the disk diffusion method, which you can apply uh, on positive blood cultures, which is largely helpful in terms of uh, um, uh, antimicrobial stewardship, we believe, because it means you can rapidly modify the treatment once blood culture uh, is, is um, uh, positive and you have, for instance, uh, gram negatives growing, you would in many cases already four hours later be able to say something about the antibiogram of, of that uh, strain which is growing. And that's almost as fast as many of the new molecular methods, but of course much less expensive and this is uh, one of the major sellings that uh, we think is, is making this method useful. We also have five meetings per year. Um, uh, during this year, we have had mostly video meetings. Normally we have physical meetings in various locations, but due to COVID uh, and the travel bans, we had to actually use uh, Zoom as uh, this webinar. Uh, for um, our meetings, but they have been taking place as expected. And um, anyone who is more interested more in, uh, in UCAST activities can also find more information on the website or, or send me an email. So I will now describe a little bit more um, about um, this system and what the main news are in this area. Uh, this is, uh, first of all, a description of the UCAS steering committee, which is the group that will meet uh, five times a year to discuss about these issues, uh, to collect the data and scrutinize the data. And, and after discussions, try to make, reach consensus on, on what the cutoff values should be and for which antimicrobial uh, bacteria combination there should be breakpoints. We have uh, expertise, for instance, in PKPD, the newly appointed Champadas and Joseph Melitiadis, 
are examples of that in addition to uh, Alistair McGowan, which has been in the committee for a long time. We also offer the opportunity for external countries to, uh, uh, which have not been traditionally part of the steering committee to stay on for a period of two years. And right now we have recently appointed one representative from Italy and one from Brazil. Before that, we had one from Portugal and one from Greece. Uh, obviously, it's now a challenge for us uh, time-wise with the video meetings because our scientific secretary is located in Adelaide in Australia and uh, Sampaio is located in Sao Paulo in Brazil. So it means it's just in the middle of the day where we can actually find a slot where we can have our meetings. So that's a bit challenging, but we have still managed to solve, resolve this during COVID times. So. He needs to go up early and he needs to go to sleep late. And that's how we resolve the issue. So these are uh, some fairly recent maps on the implementation, which is more or less overlapping with what I showed you previously. Uh, and most noteworthy is that we have here a more refined description of the percentage of laboratories using the guidelines. So this darker green means more than 90%, and then we have some countries with 50 to 90%. And really a lot of things are happening outside of Europe. So as I said, we are going to have to move to a world map more to describe uh, this uh, situation. Uh, with regards to disk diffusion, the use of paper disks that are drenched with uh, uh, a predefined amount of antimicrobial and measuring the zone of inhibition and correlating this to uh, minimal inhibitory concentrations to create cutoffs and criteria is um, used uh, in quite a lot, lot of countries, but some countries are more um, using other systems such as automated AST. The significance of this is that uh, those countries that are using disk diffusion still they will also be more uh, in a good position to establish the rapid uh, antimicrobial susceptibility testing method I was talking about. Uh, UCAST also deals with a number of other aspects than let's call it regular bacteria. For instance, we have one subcommittee dealing with antifungals. We have one a subcommittee dealing with veterinary drugs and one subcommittee which is dealing with antimicrobial drugs. And this committee has also recently made uh, a new uh, reference method for uh, susceptibility testing of, uh, of the mycobacteria. We also have a number of ad hoc groups, uh, such as one working on intrinsic resistance and expert rules, one working on MIC distributions and, um, and epidemiological cutoff values. Uh, we have uh, one which is more focusing on disk diffusion development. We are looking into whole genome sequencing and its role in the phenotypic susceptibility testing. And we also have a committee for anaerobic uh, susceptibility testing. And we have some resting committees which were active in the past, such as one for detection of resistance mechanisms, for instance, which is also something that is needed in antimicrobial susceptibility testing. Uh, one of the key points in the UK system is to have a number of um, contacts in different countries that are using the system. We encourage that each and every country form a national AST committee or what we abbreviate as a NAC. And this is the situation as of February 2020 with all of the green countries mentioned in this uh, slide having um, uh, such uh, a committee. And this committee is, uh, well, first of all, that committee is eligible to apply for a position in the UCAS um, steering committee for a period of two years, but uh, they are also kept in the loop for discussion about, uh, for instance, uh, uh, revision of, of breakpoints, uh, discussions about different methods and so on. So this provides us with an uh, immense amount of excellent feedback that we can utilize um, uh, to, to improve our system. So all of these users, the more active they are, the more we can uh, capitalize on the, their feedback to help us uh, improve the system. 
Uh, in 2019, um, we did a lot of uh, changes. Uh, we changed uh, aminoglycoside breakpoints. Uh, we did also some extensive changes, um, uh, which is a continuation of the changed uh, uh, I-group definition that we did. I will uh, touch a little bit more upon that. We updated export rules. We established uh, breakpoints for testing of Burkholderia pseudomaly, which is obviously not a great concern for Europe, but very important in many other parts of the world. So it's still a very important um, addition, we think, to our users uh, in, in, for instance, uh, Southeast Asia, who are um, seeing this as, as a clinical problem. We established breakpoints for temocillin, and we also did changes uh, for the breakpoints of uh, mesilinam, which is used for uncomplicated urinary tract infection. As of this year, we are looking into um, a consultation about change of the phosphomycin urinary tract infection breakpoint, uh, a consultation about piperacillin tazobactam and enterobacterialis, which is based uh, partly on the results from the Merino trial. We are also looking at other, um, well, oral amino penicillins, and we are also looking at breakpoints for endocarditis and meningitis, where we are also uh, doing some. Uh, um, work on this uh, to see if we can streamline it a bit more. A very important part of the UK system is the UK's development laboratory, which is located in Sweden. This laboratory is developing each year a, a revised version of the breakpoint table and is, used, um, is maintaining the disk diffusion methods, uh, also worked to uh, develop AST for Burkholderia and uh, has also been and is still working on, uh, on AST development for Nocardia in Vibrio. Uh, the UCAS Development Lab uh, also was responsible for developing the rapid AST method to be used for blood cultures um, and uh, the disk diffusion method for rapidly growing anaerobes, which we are fairly close to being able to introduce and also uh, to do work on AST for phosphomycin, temocillin, H. influenzae, to evaluate uh, colistin gradient tests, and even to evaluate uh, benzyl penicillin gradient tests for streptococcus pneumonia. These are only some of the activities, and uh, there are uh, three full-time uh, employees in this lab working with these issues um, every year. Uh, to to uh, refine and uh, um, and maintain uh, the system we have in place. This is in very brief the rapid AST system. So basically, you take a positive uh, blood culture bottle, you do direct inoculation of disk diffusion plates, uh, and you add uh, the discs, and then you incubate it for four. Uh, hours and if it's not ready to read after four hours you can extend the reading to six or eight hours and uh, this is done directly from the blood culture bottle and uh, you cannot use the, the same cutoffs as normal rather you need to have specific cutoffs in place for specific time points and this is because the, the zone is not stable it's changing over time the resistant bacteria are getting smaller zones over time and the susceptible bacteria are getting bigger zones over time. So this means when you test them at a very early stage, instead of waiting overnight, there will be less separation than if you uh, incubate them for 18 hours. But obviously there is a lot of clinical uh, gain from getting the results so much uh, uh, more well, uh, so much earlier. So in, in my lab, for instance, if we do this at eight o'clock in the morning, that means at, uh, at lunchtime, we already have uh, results, for instance, which E. coli are ESPL producing and so on. And we can tell this uh, to uh, the different uh, departments. So they will have this information before they actually go for, for lunch and they can modify the treatment. In the past, they would need to wait an additional day and the patient would also get incorrect treatment for much longer, also with the risk of, uh, of, of increasing mortality. 
We have made some uh, um, findings that uh, penicillin G gradient tests underestimate MICs for, uh, for um, Streptococcus pneumonia. This is uh, um, some important findings, which we think uh, means that one should be very careful when doing uh, gradient tests on meningitis isolates because uh, you may in effect underestimate the results and that could lead to incorrect reporting of susceptibility which could be very harmful for the patient and particularly so in the case of meningitis. Uh, this is some example of the work that was done with Temocillin, where we uh, have established uh, the MIC values and also we have established uh, which, what are the correlates in disk diffusion. Uh, so here you can see the disk diffusion zone diameters and you can see on uh, the coloring of the bars is their corresponding values. So you can see that mostly those that have large zones also have MICs which are below or equal to 16. So this means we can have a method which can tell us which strains have MICs more than or equal, uh, less than or equal to 16, uh, also by using the disk diffusion method instead of using directly an MIC method. And that's quite helpful because it simplifies things and makes it also less expensive and quicker for the labs. Some of the breakpoint changes that we have made recently is the amino glycosides. Um, for the amino glycosides, we have said that they are fine to be used in pyelonephritis, but if you have a systemic infection, you should use them with care and only in combination with other active agents. So if you, for instance, have an E. coli pneumonia, you should never treat this with monotherapy of an amino glycosides. Uh, the same thing if you have an intra-abdominal infection or something else, you should uh, stick then to some kind of combination therapy. Whereas if you have a, a focus in the urinary tract, you can still use uh, amino glycosides. So this was one of the important changes. We also did a lot of work on the definition of the I group. And this is a paper that was written together with CLSI, where we explain about the differences uh, in the definition of I, which means intermediate in the CLSI system, which has a very long definition. And in the UK system, it means susceptible increased exposure. It means if you can increase the antimicrobial exposure by increasing the dose or the dosing frequency or something like this, you could still consider it susceptible. Whereas uh, the old I definition was really more discouraging uh, clinicians to use a certain drug because it was more emphasizing that it was uncertain. And we feel that in the age of antimicrobial stewardship, uh, it is sometimes correct that we try to move uh, towards uh, still using this as, as treatment. Sometimes uh, uh, we only have I as the, the highest value you can get. For instance, for Pseudomonas, if, you, if the strain has no, uh, no resistance mechanisms, it would be reported as, susceptible in, as uh, I group to piperacillin, tazobactam, ceftacidim, cefepim, imipenem, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin. And that just means for the clinician, if you want to treat Pseudomonas with these drugs, you need to use high dose. Some do, uh, uh, drugs which have a dosing regimen, which is a bit uh, more uh, adequate to cover pseudomonas, also with normal dosing, they can still be reported as susceptible. But the other ones, you report them as I, and you have to explain to the clinician that this is something that means you can still use uh, the, the compound, uh, but you have to use it in high dose. So it's a, it's a stronger message about getting the dosing right, it's not only about selecting the drug, but if you select piperacillin tazobactam for dosing three times daily, for instance, that's too low. If you select ceftacidim one gram three times daily, it's too low. You need to go two gram three times daily instead. So these are some examples of how the I group could be used to emphasize the message. 
This is an example of the breakpoints for uh, Burkholderia pseudomalii, where we also have disk diffusion criteria. And I think in, in some parts of the world, this uh, is uh, going to be very important and very helpful for clinicians. Uh, we have had, for instance, uh, a lot of uh, communication with uh, Thailand, Cambodia, uh, Vietnam, some countries that face, uh, and even Australia have uh, a lot of problems with this. And now there is a, a, an easier method that they can use. Uh, which is also cheap and, and quite feasible to establish. Temocillin is a drug that has been available in some European countries. It's um, a penicillin derivative, but it has quite specific useful activity against many uh, enterobacterialis, uh, but uh, it does not have any uh, gram positive activity. So it could have a niche to be used in treatment of some gram negative infections. And this is also where we established criteria uh, uh, which are now available on the UCAS website. But obviously for those countries that cannot get access to Temocillin, this is of limited interest. But for some European countries, it is of, of some interest. We have set also breakpoints for new agents. Uh, one of them is Keftolosin tazobactam, which is not a new agent, but which was available. Uh, it had an indication for intra-abdominal infection and complicated urinary tract infection, but now there is also an indication for, for hospital-acquired pneumonia, and this is with another dosing regimen than the previous one. Imipenem relibactam is one of the new uh, um, combinations of a carbapenem with the beta-lactamase inhibitor, and cefidrocol is a new um, uh, Cephalosporin, which has uh, uh, a quite unique uh, um, mechanism of uptake. It's taken up by iron uh, transporters. And this one has uh, quite uh, extensive activity against many strains which are resistant to most other antimicrobials. So uh, it could, for instance, have uh, have activity against strains with metallobetalactamases, uh, both in, in uh, Enterobacterialis and in Pseudomonas, and it also has acinetobacter activity. So this was also established during the year, and, uh, but is not available in all places um, uh, yet. But the criteria are available, and also a disk diffusion method for those who would like to test it. This is unfortunately what I will not be able to see, uh, but uh, these days we all need to to travel in our minds instead uh, and we can look at nice pictures of places where we would like to travel and this is uh, maybe how we will need to continue doing for a while but that can also be fine uh, sometimes it's it's good for a human being to be longing for a travel instead of going for so many travels that you get fed up with traveling. It's probably also very good for the planet. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, dear Professor, thank you very much for your useful uh, lecture. And uh, do you have any question, audience? Uh, uh, professor, one of our participants have a question. Uh, and it is his question, could you please talk about rapid AST if it is available for candida blood infections or other fungal blood infections? Yes, I can talk about that. Unfortunately, it's not. And uh, in general, we do not have a disc diffusion method for candida. It's, uh, it's fairly complicated. It's possible that it will not be so easy to uh, establish uh, even disk diffusion for candida, but it might be something for uh, the, the antifungal committee to look into. But since we don't even have disk diffusion criteria, we certainly do not have for rapid uh, uh, testing of, uh, of um, antifungals, unfortunately. Uh, thanks. Uh, would you please ask your question? Uh, excuse me? No. Victor Ali Alwani, Alabi. Mr. Alabi, could you please ask your question? Hi. You can raise your hand. 
Yes. Hello. Uh, no, no. Question? No, the, the present was very good and complete. And I don't know any question. Thank you very much from Mr. Dr. Christian Gische and others. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, professor, I have a question about the cholesterol. Do you change yeah. any uh, f um, decision for MIC for cholesterol or not? Is there like... Uh, a lot of the work has been done on this, uh, trying to see if there are other methods you can use than, than uh, broth microdilution. So it has been tried, for instance, to alter the um, concentration of different uh, cations uh, but this has not been successful. So still the only method we can recommend for cholestine testing is uh, broth microdilution. Um, and it's not really for lack of effort. A lot of time and resources has been spent on this, but we have not been able to find uh, good correlations uh, with the other tests. So they all have problems. Some of the rapid tests have problems and the gradient tests have problems. And even if you do additives, uh, there has been some papers out on that, um, uh, which describe um, evaluation of, of different methods. And I can provide those uh, to th those who are interested. But uh, the bottom line is still, unfortunately, the only way is uh, to use broth microdilution. However, many commercial companies have made uh, more or less uh, kits you can use for this. Uh, so, so you can use, um, for instance, uh, uh, you don't need to use an entire MIC plate, rather you can have MIC strips, which you can tear off and then you just use a certain number of wells. And this means you can buy one plate and it would be sufficient for something like, I think uh, 12 isolates or something like this. So there are different com commercial solutions. Uh, and, and of course, those who want could make their own in-house plates where they could do several on the same plate, but uh, it comes down to having to use uh, a broth-based uh, method. Excuse me, I, I cannot hear right now. I think you may be on mute. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for nice uh, presentation. It was very useful for us and uh, uh, acceptance of uh, our invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, the other speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Mohammad Reza Salih from Tehran University, Imam Khomeini uh, Hospital. He is an uh, infectious disease specialist and uh, he's talking about antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic prescription during the COVID-19 pandemic period. Here, Professor, would you please come and start your testing? Uh, <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Sali from the University of Medical Sciences. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Galician and I'm infectious disease specialist from Imam Khomeini uh, Hospital uh, in Tehran. And these days, I've been uh, involved uh, with visiting a lot of COVID 19 patients. And uh, today, I would like to talk a bit about antimicrobial resistance and the roles of antibiotic therapy and antimicrobial stewardship plan in COVID-19 patients. Uh, at the end, uh, I would uh, like to apologize uh, for speaking Persian in continuation of my uh, presentation. Uh, I hope uh, my slides could be useful for English language speak English language audience. <coughs> Thank you. The name of God is the Salam and the Aspect of the Dustan and the Koran Aziz. I am the Dustan and 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 the Dustan
یکی از بحثایی که برای ما به عنوان در واقع پزشک و کلینسین در بالین خیلی اهمیت داره تو های ویروسی بحث ابتلا به های بکتریال هستش یا حتی های فنگال که ممکنه همراهی داشته باشه با انواع اقسام های ویروسی یکی از دغدغه‌های اصلی ما در های ویروسی قبلی به خصوص پاندمی و آنفلانزای قبلی بحث های بکتریایی بود که احتمالاً همکار میکروبیولوژیست ما بهتر از من در جمع هستن که ما بحث استرپتوکوکنومونیا رو داشتیم نوموکوک رو داشتیم و شایتن عامل پوست آنفلانزا نومونیا و استافیلوکوک رو روز رو به عنوان در واقع وخیم ترین حالت بکتریایی که ممکن بود بعد از آنفلانزا اتفاق بیفته و جون خیلی از مریضای ما رو تحت تاثیر قرار با این کانسپت شاید بشه گفت ما وارد فضای کووید 19 شدیم که مثل آنفلانزا در واقع کرونا ویروس ها احتمال داره که در واقع کوینفکشن های بکتری آلفا فونگال هم باعث وجود داشته باشه اما وقتی برگشتیم به هم خانواده های سارس کووید تو نگاه کردیم یعنی مرس کرونا ویروس و سارس کووید یک متوجه شدیم که خیلی در واقع فونت های بکتریایی در سایر انواع در واقع خانواده کرونا ویروس ها شایع نبوده حداقل میشه گفتش که اطلاعاتی که تا الان موجود هست نشون دهنده این مسئله هستش که در مورد مرس کووید و همینطور سارس کووید یک عفونت های بکتریایی به شدت و حدت آنفلانزا در واقع وجود نداشت یه مطالعه در واقع مولتی سنتری که رو مرس کووید در واقع انجام شده بود در عربستان سعودی در کریتیکال ایل پیشنت هایی که مطلع به مرس کرونا وایروس شده بودن 18 درصد همراهی با بکتریال اینفکشن که اکثر موارد موارد در واقع عفونت های بکتریایی مولتی دراگ رزیستنس بیمارستانی بودن و 5 درصد کو اینفکشن با سایر ویروس ها به خصوص ویروس آنفلانزا در این بیماران گزارش شد در مورد تجویز آنتی بیوتیک ها بریتی سوسایتی فور آنتی مکروبیال کیموتراپی اومده و یه آرتیکلی رو پابلش کرده به عنوان در واقع تحت عنوان Antibiotic Prescribing in the Context of COVID-19 Pandemic تو اینجا یه سری مطالب اومده گفته که مطالب حداقل برای من با عنوان یک کینیسیان مطالب جالبی هست از جمله این که درسته که در واقع کووید اجزای مختلفی از زندگی ما را تحت تاثیر خودش قرار داده ولی به صورت مشخص به نظر میرسه که مدیریت افونت های مختلف ما هم در ستینگ درمانی تحت تاثیر هست یعنی ما این رو داریم روزانه احساس میکنیم به خصوص واقعیت چه بخوایم همین بحث عفونت های بکتریایی رو خیلی تحت تاثیر قرار داده و تجویز دقیق آنتی بیوتیک ها یا تجویز صحیح آنتی بیوتیک ها رو در ستین با اختلال جدی مواجه کرد علت چی هستش واقعیت قضیه کووید 19 این هست که درسته که ما هممون میدونیم کووید 19 یا عفونت ویروسیه و خودش نیاز به پوشش آنتی بیوتیکی نداره اما مختصات بالینیش و مختصات تظاهرات رادیولوژیکش خیلی وقتا ما کینیسیان ها رو به اشتباه یا به شک میندازه که ممکنه بیمارمون دچار عفونت های بکتریایی باشه و خیلی از دوستان من دیدم که در ستینک های مختلف هم از بخش های معمول یا ستینک های اینتنسیو که شروع میکنن به تجویز آنتی بیوتیک ها این مختصاتی که خدمتتون عرض میکنم خب تب های بالا هستش پلوریتیک چست پین هستش، تنگ نفس و صرفه هست بعضی از تظاهرات رادیولوژیکش به خصوص کانسولیدیشنی که آدم در بعضی از سیتی اسکن ها میدونه آنها به اشتباه میدازه که ممکنه بیمار من افونت بکتریایی داشته باشه و عرض کردم خیلی از دوستان ما در ابتدای کووید تصورشون نسبت به کووید تصور, تصور آنفلانزا و پوست اینفلانزا بکتریال اینفکشن ها بود و به خاطر همین در مصرف خیلی افراد می شد و تعداد زیادی از بیمار آنتیبیوتیک دریافت می‌کرد. این مقاله ریویوی وجود داره که اینفکشن زمان پیشن ویت کووید 19 دی نید فور کامبینیشن تراپی. منظور کامبینیشن تراپی بحثی نیست که کنار آنتی وایرال، آنتی بیوتیک هم یا آنتی فونگال هم تجویز بکنه. اومده در واقع یه بررسی کرده مقالات مختلفی که در مورد بحث کوینفکشن ها بوده. تو این مطالعه باز اومده اینو گفته که در مورد سارس، سارس کووید 1 و همچنین در مورد در واقع مرس به نظر میرسه که در واقع میزان افونت های بکتریایی خیلی شایع نبوده با این وجود اینو ذکر میکنه که در مورد کووید 19 هنوز اطلاعات ما در مورد کوینفکشن ها خیلی کامل نیستش 
کماکان احتمال کوینفکشن ها یه نگرانی جدی هست برای کلینسیان ها و خیلی وقتا این نگرانی جدی باعث اوورویوز و عروز آنکیبیتیکال و سیوتیف در ستینگ های درمانی و بالا بردن نهایتا میزان میکروارگانیسم های مقاوم در همون ستینگ ها میشه تو این مطالعه اومده در واقع مطالعات مختلفی رو مورد بررسی و یه تیبلی داره که کوینفکشن ها رو ذکر کرده مطالعه از چین هستش با 99 بیمار از ایالات متحده هست باز 21 بیمار کریتیکالی ای 104 بیمار باز از چین 21 بیمار از چین و از ایالات متحده 116 بیمار تو تمام این مطالعات بحثی کوینفکشن مورد بررسی قرار گرفته و اگر به صورت مشخص ستون دو ستون دوایی که مونده به آخر و آخر سمت راست رو نگاه کنید بحث کوینفکشن بکتریایی و فنگار رو مطرح کرده که اگه نگاه کنیم خیلی همراهی جدی رو در اکثر مطالعات یا نزدیک به صفر هستش حالا یه مقدار بالاتر که همراهی داره در مورد در واقع در مورد عفونت های قارچی هم خیلی میزان میزان قابل توجه و جدی نبود ما خودمون یه مطالعه ای که در تهران انجام دادیم و با کمک آقای دکتر خداویسی از دانشکده بهداشت از سایر دوستان اومدیم و بررسی داریم میکنیم کوینفکشن های فونگار رو اهم از در واقع بحث ایست ها و مونت ها که این در واقع قسمتی از همون مطالعه هست که ما آوردیم و بیشترین چیزی که ما پیدا کردیم بحث اوروفارنجیال کاندیدیازیس بود در بیماران مبتلا به کووید 19 تو این مطالعه که ما انجام دادیم البته خب تعدادی هم مولد به دست آوردیم که انشالله در آینده در اون رو هم نتیجهش رو منتشر خواهیم کرد تو این در واقع مطالعه ما اومدیم بیمارای بیمارستان خودمون و چند بیمارستان حوزه شهر تهران رو در پیک اول اپیدمی مورد بررسی قرار دادیم یکی از چیزهایی که در واقع جلب توجهمون کرد اوروفارنجیال کاندیدیازیس بود در این بیمارا نهایتا نمونه گیری از ناحیه دهان و حلق برای اوروفارنجیال کاندیدیازیس انجام شد با بیسیکلکس پی سی آر مورد بررسی قرار گرفت و آنتی فونگال ساسیبیلیتی هم برای قارچ های برای در واقع آنتی فونگال های مختلف برایش گذاشته شد پنجا و سه بیمار رو ما در واقع کشف کردیم با رو فرنجیال کاندیدیازیز که شاید ترین کومودیتی هایی که داشتیم اختلالات قلبی بود و دیابه مهمترین ریسک فاکتوری که اکثر این بیمار رو شن لیمفوپنی های قابل توجه بود یعنی بیمار هایی که کووید نانکین گرفته بودن کووید باعث لیمفوپنی و نهایتا به نظر میسید که از علل در واقع ابتلاشون به افونت های قارچی همین لیمفوپنی های شدیدی بود که اتفاق افتید در مورد سویه هایی که به دست اومد شایعی ترینش کاندید الویکنس بود هفته بومز هفته اومد در سر بعدش کاندید بلابراتا بود نتیجه جالب از نظر ساسپتیبیلیتی بود که به تمام رده های آنتی فونگال حساس بود و به نظر میرسید خیلی ما با کاندیده های بیمارستان خودمون مواجه نیستیم و اکثرا فلو نورمال های خودشون هستش که اوورگروس شده احتمالا و از ساعت جامعه در واقع به بیمارستان منتقل شد جالب هست اکثر موارد 33 تا از تعداد مورد خدمت رو نرس کردم در هفته اول ورودشون بوده حالا شاید برای دوستان جالب باشه ما مکرد بیماری رو میدیدیم که تو کلینیک مبتلا به کووید 19 هم سر پایی میان و نیاز به بستری هم ندارن میگن گلومون درد میکنه وقتی معاینه میکنیم تراشه های در واقع سفید رنگ تو ناحیه بوکال ناحیه در واقع حلق و ناحیه زبانشون میگن که به نظر میسه باز احتمالا در تپای از لیفوپنیای هستش که این بیمارا در واقع بهش دوچار شدن در هفته های بعدی بستری خب تعداد قابل توجهی نبوده هفته دوم ده تا هفته سوم هشت تا هفته چهارم اونایی که باقی موندن دو مورد رو تونستیم کشف کنیم همونطور که خدمتتون عرض کردم کاردیوواسکولار دیزیز ها دیابت کرونی کیدنی دیزیز و هماتولوژیک مگنیس اما یه نکته که مرتبط با مبحث امروزمون هست اکثر اونها از این تعدادی که خدمتتون عرض کردم 92 درصدشون آنتی بیوتیک گرفتن و آنتی بیوتیک واسیو تیپ گرفته بودن که یکی از الری که قطعا باعث ایجاد اوروفارنجیال کاندیدیازیس و اورو و در واقع اوروفارنجیال اوور گروس کاندیداتور اینها شده بود مصرف اینا یعنی همین آنتی بیوتیک های واسیو تیپ باز توی مقاله دیگه سی آی دی اومده در واقع بحث بکتریال و فونگال کوین انفکشن رو به همراه یه ریوی روی تجویز آنتی بیوتیک ها در این بیمار مورد بررسی قرار اومده و مدلاین امبیس و به آف ساینس رو ریویو کرده راجب سارس کووید یک، مرس کورنا وایروس و سارس کووید تو و نهایتا اومده این بیمار رو از نظر دریافت در واقع آنتی ماکروبیات پرسکرایبینگ هم مورد بررسی قرار به خصوص بیماری که مطلب سارس کووید تو بوده 
در مجموع 62 تا بیمار از 806 بیماری که مبتلا به سارس کووید تو یا کووید 19 بودن بکتریال یا فونگال کو اینفکشن همراه با کووید 19 نشون داشتن یعنی 8 درصد بیماران نهایتا بکتریال یا فونگال اینفکشن داشتن این در حالی که اگر پایین در این لاین پایین رو دقت بفهمین 72 درصد این بیماران آنتی بیوتیک که واسیتیف رو گرفته بودن به نظر می رسه که قسمت عمده ای از این بیمارا دارن به صورت در واقع نادرستی تحت درمان آنتی بیوتیکی قرار می گیرن و خب خبرهایی هم که از کشورهای از کشور چین و جنوب شرق آسیا میرسه به نظر می رسه که آنتی بیوتیک تراپی های واسیتیف که اونها در چند ماه اول اپیدمی در کشورشون انجام دادن با افزایش قابل توجه میزان مقاومت های باکتریایی اونجا همراه بود. تقریبا میشه گفت در اکثر در واقع مباحثی که مرتبط با کووید 19 و آنتی بیوتیک تراپی هست الان تاکید روی بحث استوارچیپ بحث استوارچیپ تیم و استوارچیپ پروگرام وجود داره و محدود کردن مصرف در واقع آنتی بیوتیک ها در ستینگ کووید 19 WHO اصلا اومده در مورد کلینیکال منیجمنت کووید 19 و مصرف آنتی بیوتیک ها چند تا نکته خیلی اساسی رو ذکر کرد یکی این که بیماری مایل یا خفیف کووید 19 نیاز به تجویز آنتی بیوتیک از تریتمنت یا از پروفیلاکسی نداره و استفاده از این آنتی بیوتیک ها نهایتا با افزایش میزان میکروبانس های مقاوم همراه خواهد باز WHO در مورد بیماری مادریت هم ذکر میکنه که در نهایت در واقع نیاز به آنتی بیوتیک تراپی ویژه‌ای ندارن و بیشتر مشکلاتشون با خود کووید 19 قابل توجیه هست اگر پزشکی حالا فکر میکنه شک میکنه که نیازمند این هستش که برای بیمارش آنتی بیوتیک تجویز بکنه میتونه از آن در آموکسیسیلین یا آموکسیسیلین کلاونیک اسید به عنوان آنتی بیوتیک های اولیه برای درمان بیماراش استفاده کنه این چیزی که ما در کشور خودمون به وفور می‌بینیم مصرف ماکرولیت های مثل آزیترومایسین یا کینونون های مثل لیموفلوکسوسین به هیچ وجه توصیه نشد ما این دو مادر رو خدمتون گفتم یه نکته واقعیت وجود داره برای ماهایی که تو کلینیک درگیر مریضای کووید 19 هستیم مریضای بسیار بدخالی هستن که درگیری دو طرفی قیه پیدا میکنن درگیری ها معمولا بسیار وسیع هست و نهایتا با نارسایی تنفسی قابل توجه هم از خیلی وقتا دوستان میگن که این احتمال داره بیمارمون مبتلا به عفونت بکتریایی باشه و نهایتا پزشک ممکنه به این صرافت بیفته که از آنتی بیوتیک های وسیوتیف استفاده بکنه توصیه دبلیو ایچو این هست که در این جمع موارد حتما سپسیس فورکاپ مناسب برای بیمار انجام بشه و اون جایی هستش که دوستان, ما دوستان میکرو بیولوزیست هم میتونن به ما کمک بکنن که ما نهایتا بعد از 48 تا 72 ساعت با توجه به سپسیس فورکاپ ها و آیزولیشن های میکرو میکروارگانیزم همون بتونیم در واقع تصمیم بگیریم راجع به نرو کردن آنتی بیوتیک تراپی و نهایت دی کردن آنتی بیوتیک ها و نهایتا در واقع یه سری ملاحظات رو تو بحث آنتی بیوتیک تراپی قرار دادن و گفتن شاید استفاده از این ملاحظات کمک بکنه که ما از آنتی بیوتیک ها کمتر و بجاتر استفاده کنیم یکی از نکات مهمش این هستش که ما معمولا میزای کووید 19 اون ترشحات چرکی قابل توجه نداره اگر در بیمارا دچار ترشحات چرکی قابل توجه به خصوص در بیماری که زمینه کرونیک لاین دیزیز یا در واقع کرونیک ابسترکتیو پلمونری دیزیز سی او پی دی دارن مواجه میشیم میتونیم از آنتی بیوتیک استفاده کنیم یکی از نکات دیگه این هستش که اکثر بیمارای مبتلا به کووید 19 خودشون سی آر پی شون بالا میره و سی آر پی بالا در این بیمارا نشون دهنده در واقع عفونت های بکتریایی نیست و نیاز به ایجاد یا به تجویز آنتی بیوتیک ها رو در این بیمارا ایجاد نمیکنه و نکته بعد این هستش که ما اگر داریم آنتی بیوتیک هم به اینها میدیم بنیم به سمت سوی اینکه برنامه ریزی کنیم برای دی اسکالیشن و باریک کردن طیف در واقع آنتی بیوتیک تراپی و نهایتا خیلی ها معتقدن این بیمارا نیاز به تجویز طولانی مدت آنتی بیوتیک ها ندارن یک از شهرستان که رفته بودم خیلی از این بیمارایی که مثلا 18 روزه روز بود بستری بودن عین 18 روزه روز رو داشتن آنتی بیوتیک وسیو طیف میگرفتن به نظر می رسد نهایتا دوره های کوتاه و کوتاه آنتی بیوتیکی 5 تا 7 روز بتونه دوره های نهایتا مناسبی برای بیمار باشه در آخر میخوام واقعیت رو بخوایم با توجه به اینکه ظرف یک هفته ده روز گذشته تعداد بیماری کووید 19 در کشورمون کم شده به خصوص در ستینگ های درمانی ما در شهر تهران از مردم عزیزمون تشکر کنم به خاطر زدن ماسک 
و واقعیت چه بخواییم علا رقم این که تمام این مباحث از جهت تشخیصی و درمانی برای ما مهم هست چه در مورد کووید نایمتین چه در مورد میکروگانیسم های مقابل هیچ چیزی مهمتر از پیشگیری نیست در مورد کووید نایمتین پیشگیری مهمترین کاری که میتونه به ما کمک بکنه تو بحث پیشگیری زدن ماسک و رعایت فاصله فیزیکی و اجتماعی هست و در مورد میکروارگانیسم های مقابل استفاده بهینه از آنتی بیوتیک ها و نهایتا اعمال پروتکل های کنترل عفونت میتونه از گسترش و شروع میکروارگانیسم های مقابل که هر سال جون تعداد زیادی از بیماری ما رو میگیره جلوگیری بکنه ممنون و متشکرم از اگر دوستان و همکاران از این سوالی دارن من خدمت شما هستم. سلام من خدمت دکتر. سلام دکتر. صدا من داری این صدا چه؟ بله جان بله بله. عرض سلام دارم خدمتتون عرض خسته نباشید دارم و همچنین بقیه شنوندگان عزیز. آقای دکتر با توجه به اینکه اخیراً از پروبیوتیکا خیلی استفاده میشه برای هم به عنوان پروفیلاکسی، هم به عنوان پریونشن و پروبیوتیک بله، پروبیوتیک به عنوان پروفیلاکسی و حتی به عنوان درمان برای تیریتمنت هم زیاد استفاده میشه برای باکتریال انفکشن و با توجه به اینکه شما فرمودین که در مورد افرادی که افونتشون سیور خیلی پیشرفته شده برای کووید 19 مخواستم ازتون بپرشتم که به نظر شما آیا امکانش هست که ما بتونیم از پرابیوتیک هم استفاده کنیم برای درمان در این افراد حالا چه به عنوان این که یه جور در واقع اثر آنتی بیوتیک رو کاهش بده چون آنتی بیوتیک های وسیعتش هم اینطور که شما گفتین یا آنتی بیوتیک ها زرار های زیادی دارن برحال برای ماکروبایوم اینتستینال یا چیزهای دیگه زرار زیاد دارن میخواستم ببینم چون مقالات کمی در این زمینه هست تا جایی که من مطالعه کردم مخواستم ازتون بپرسم مطالعه تجربه چخصیتون چطور بوده مثلا شده از پرابیوتیک استفاده بشه حالا چه در مراکز ما یا در مراکز دیگه دکتر ما در مورد بیماری به جز کووید نایتین قبلا مطالعاتی در مورد پرابیوتیک ها هم خوندیم هم خودمون انجام داریم اما تو تو خیلی از موارد تو بهتر از من میدونی که در واقع تو پروتکل ها و گایدلاین های درمانی پذیرفته نشده و هنوز جزء مباحث بسیار چالنجینگ هست تو بحث درمان در مورد کووید 19 من خودم مطالعه نداشتم راجع به پروبیوتیک ها اما یکی از مشکلات خیلی قابل توجه این بیمارا اسهال هست خیلی از بیمارا دچار انتروپاتی و اسهال میشن که شاید تو اون فاز بتونه در واقع پروبیوتیک ها برای این بیمارا کمک کننده باشه ولی اینکه بتونیم در واقع برای درمان استفاده کنیم ارز کردم خدمت حتی این آنتیبیوتیک ها نباید داده بشه چون علل اصول بیماری بیماری ویروسی هست و خیلی نیازمند استفاده از در واقع آنتی ماکروبیال ها نیستش خیلی من رد کردم یه سوالی دوستان پرسند در مورد استفاده از آنتی تینف های آلفا مثل این فریکسی و مطالعاتی که شده بود به ضرر استفاده از آنتی تینف های آلفا آنتی سی دی بیست ها این مثل چیزی مثل این فلکسیمب، ریتوکسیمب بود اما خب بحث در واقع آنتی اینترلوکین یک یا آنتوگونیس اینترلوکین یک تاسیلوزومب خب بحث خیلی مشهوری هست هرچند این اواخر در واقع آخرین مقالاتی که با حمایت خود کمپانی روش انجام داد خیلی به نفع استفاده از تاسیلوزومب نیست اما با این وجود اگه یادتون باشه تو اسفن ماه و اوائل در واقع اپیدمی استفاده از اکتم را معروف بود می گفتن درمان در واقع کووید 19 کشف شده و اسمش اکتم را ولی بعدها دیدن که خیلی هم اثرات قابل توجهی نداره و با توجه به اینکه یک ایمونو ساپریشن فیز طولانی مدت داره خیلی از بیماری که این استفاده کرده بودن نهایتا با باکتریال یا فنگال انفکشن های ناشی از نقص ایمنی ناشی از این دارو از بین رفت اگه سوال دیگه دوستان دارم ممنون از همه دوستان و استاد از من سر به خانده تو شاشه و آیدی تو فیض آبادی به خاطر دردش شد مچکی من تشکر میکنم از آقای دکتر سالهی به خاطر سخرانیشون که واقعا خیلی مفید بود و به خیلی از سالهی ما جواب داد امیدوارم که 
تو این شرایط با بیماران کووید 19 که در تماس هستن و واقعا خیلی هم مشکل هست موفق و سلامت باشن The other speaker is Dr. Fatima Kalim from Pakistan Dr. Thank you very much for your accepting our invitation and Dr. Fatima Kalim she speaks about Reviving older and forgotten antibiotics for MDR bacteria. Dr. Kalim is a medical microbiologist from Islamabad of Pakistan. Thank you very much. Would you please start your Uh, lecture. Thanks. Hi everyone. So it's really great to be here today and uh, today I'll start with my presentation now and it's it was great to hear all of you and um, it's very good to hear all the microbiologists are concerned about all the antimicrobial resistance we are um, seeing in our day-to-day -day lives in our, and we are handling these things day to day. So uh, I hope you all can see my screen. So let's start. Uh, basically, um, I would like to talk about the revival of older and forgotten antibiotics for the newer superbugs. We are all really much aware of the superbugs term. So here you can see a picture I have uh, copied from uh, internet and you can see that these two bacteria which are seemingly very angry on us and because we are subjecting them to newer and newer and newer antibiotics in our daily life. So they are getting very furious and they are getting very angry as, at us and they are basically fed up of as we are fed up of them as well. So, as we are making new antibiotics, they are getting new and new mechanisms and they're adopting new and new mechanisms to get resistant to all those antibiotics. So basically, there is increasing resistance in all of the bacteria, but increasing resistance in gram-negative bacteria is an immense challenge. There is emergence of multi-drug resistant as well as extremely drug resistant and now even pan-drug resistant bacteria. Now this is very challenging for us. As science is advancing, we are implementing antibiotics very rapidly, but these bacteria are adopting to these antibiotics very rapidly as well. One of my professors once told us, he was a microbiology professor, and he once told us that the dumbest of bacteria is smarter than the smartest of human beings. At that time, we didn't understand the meaning of this statement, that the dumbest of bacteria is smarter than the smartest of human beings. How come we are human beings? How can a bacteria, a small little bacteria can be smarter than us? But now, when we have come in this field and now we see these hospital acquired infections and these life threatening infections in our daily life, now we understand that no doubt these bacteria are really, really are smarter than us. As soon as we adapt any antimicrobial, they start producing some mechanisms, getting those plasmids and getting resistant to that bacteria. So as soon as we develop a weapon against them. They develop resistance against that weapon. And the treatment options which we have against them are further shrinking. And we as mankind are always threatened by this aggressive advent of these gram-negative as well as gram-positive superbugs. And the most important thing is that we are now threatened by hospital-acquired infections. They are on a rise. And whenever a hospital infect acquired infection is there, that is obviously a very, very, very bad infection. 
and that is usually caused by a superpower, which is multi-drug resistant. So what is the approach? How can we tackle these things? We can tackle these things with multifaceted approach. Now, what are those multifaceted things which we can do to tackle with this problem? We need to do biomedical innovation. We need to have improved surveillance. There should be rapid microbiological diagnosis to diagnose and to prescribe proper antibiotics. In short terms, these are antimicrobial stewardships. And then there, there must be formulation of better and more effective empirical therapy, which is given on the best guess basis regarding the antimicrobial data of that region. Because our, in Pakistan, our bacteria are quite different from the bacteria you're isolating in European countries. We are very close by to Iran, but still antimicrobial susceptibilities do change. There are some general patterns, but there are some little changes as well. So all of these formulation of anti antimicrobial therapy, which is empirical, should always be moderated according to the regional centers. And obviously we should try to make up new antibiotics, right? But the thing is that the pipeline of new antibiotics is drying up. Pharmaceutical companies are losing interest in this thing because that is not many monetary interest in this making of new antimicrobials. Research and development is very expensive, risky. And the most important thing is that it is very time consuming, right? So for example, uh, if we initiate a research and development program for a new antimicrobial, it would require likely around 10 more years and investment of around $800 million for, to bring a new drug in the market. So we have to look for other options as well. So what are the other options we have for this kind of uh, superbug infections? In my view, why we are just, and the second thing is that the newer antibiotics are not keeping pace with the menace of superbugs. And the important thing is that there has been no new antibiotic approved for clinical use for gram-negative bacteria in the last three decades, which is quite a big time. If an antibiotic has been introduced, most of them have been in introduced for gram-positive superbugs, for example example, methicillin resistance staphylococcus aureus. But the drug companies as countries are not focusing on gram-negative superbugs because they're getting resistant day by day. So in my thing, the, there are many antibiotics which are old, but they're still young. And we need to reevaluate and revive those older and forgotten compounds. And they may prove beneficial for treatment of these superbugs. The thing is, as I told you before, that once a professor said that dumbest of bacteria are smarter than smartest of the human beings. So when we stop using an antimicrobial, bacteria start making some mechanisms. They are acquiring some plasmids to get resistant to that antimicrobial. And when we see that that bacteria is totally getting resistant to that. Now bacteria is burdened. That is working hard to destroy our antimicrobial, which, have, which we have made for them. But at the same time, bacteria is so smart that it doesn't want to keep an unwanted load on itself. So it starts shedding those plasmids, which are containing antimicrobial resistance genes for those antibiotics which are not longer being used. So they are shedding those plasmids. They are getting rid of that unwanted load. Why to keep an unwanted load when they can make those plasmids which are now useful for getting resistant to those newer antimicrobials. So they are very smart and they're shedding those resistance mechanisms. They are getting rid of those resistance mechanisms and because we are not using the older drugs. So we can use this thing against these bacteria. Basically, forgotten antibiotics are not available in many countries. So they are not being used anywhere. 
right? So bacteria have also forgotten them. And they have also started losing interest in getting resistant to those antibiotics. But we can use this thing against these bacteria. Now, these antimicrobials, which have been forgotten, they can be successful treatment options for multi-drug resistant bacterial infections and can make their place in current clinical practice. But all should this should be done after re-evaluation. For example, in our country, we are facing a menace of extremely drug resistant typhoidal salmonella. And chloramphenicol, as you all know, was first considered as first line antimicrobial for typhoid fever. We all know this, that chloramphenicol was once first line drug for typhoid fever. But as the bacteria developed and they started developing resistance against those first line antimicrobial drugs, that bacteria became resistant to chloramphenicol and we started to observe all typhoidal salmonella coming to our microbiology lab as being resistant to all first line drugs. Then we started using chlor uh, chloroquinolones for those um, typhoidal salmonella isolates. Slowly and slowly, they started developing resistant against chloroquinolones. Once ciprofloxacin was used as a wonder drug for the treatment of typhoidal salmonella. But now we are isolating typhoidal salmonella, which are resistant to chloramphenicol, ampicillin, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, as well as ciprofloxacin. But as this menace continued, we saw that all of the isolates which are now coming, which are resistant to even third generation capellosporins, like ceftriaxone, we are isolating that sort of typhoidal salmonella as well. That is pan drug resistant, extremely drug resistant typhoidal salmonella. And we are even having outbreaks of such uh, isolates that are usually at Karachi and in Hyderabad. We had two outbreaks of such resistant typhoidal salmonella. And then we noticed that these bacteria are now getting again sensitive to chloramphenicol. They are resistant to. Um, ciprofloxacin, all fluoroquinolones, as well as to third generation. <laughs> Here, audience, um, uh, maybe it's a problem with uh, Fatima Kalim. Uh, we don't have uh, her sound and uh, that's correct. Let's wait a moment. If we cannot uh, connect with her, we, uh, the other speaker will start their lecture.
Anna. Uh, uh, dear colleague, uh, excuse me for this connection. Uh, I uh, this is the uh, first session uh, I'm the other speaker, and uh, I will st start my talking. Uh, I uh, talk about rule of antibiotic resistance carriers on increasing of antibiotic resistance in community and hospitals. Uh, WHHF in uh, 22. Uh, told that uh, uh, speak about the importance of antibiotic resistance and the treats of it. It told uh, AMR is a, a slow taxonomy that threatens to undergo uh, a century of medical progress. All of us know about the importance of antibiotic resistance. Oh. Antibiotic resistance is an urgent public health street and a CDC priority uh, and uh, has the potential to impact all people at uh, every stage of life. Uh, there is several strategy for uh, controlling antibiotic resistance. One of them is uh, infection prevention and control. And uh, uh, for preventing of antimicrobial resistance through infection control, several also uh, aspects we had uh, to pay, have pay attention. For in one, one in 10 patients get an infection while receiving care and more than 50% of surgical site infection can be antibiotic resistant, and effective infection prevention and control reduce health care associated infection by at least uh, 30%. Many hospital acquired infection are caused by the most urgent and serious antibiotic resistance treats. Uh, the germs causing this deadly infection can spread between patient and inside of and between healthcare facilities when patients are transferred from uh, one healthcare facility to another without appropriate action to stop the spread. Uh, WHO uh, divided the pathogens into three criteria. Uh, uh, priority uh, in base of uh, dangerous and uh, the critical high and medium. The carbapenemase resistance enterobacteria cell located in the critical priority. Uh, and because of this detection of antibiotic resistant carrier in community and hospital is very important. Extended spectrum beta lactamase producing enterobacterials and carbapenemase resistance enterobacterials in fecal carriage have become a global health concern. Detection of putative virulent ESP producing E. coli isolates among asymptomatic carriers is a treating issue in public health. Intestinal colonization by ESPLP and CP is considerable since ESPL genes are mostly located on conjugated plasmids, and this could lead to transmission of resistance genes to other bacteria across the species uh, to other person and infection in the host. They also usually carry other genes that are associated with only glycoside or fluoroquine resistance. This situation is of the great concern as transmission of this plasmid could be resulted in intestinal colonization with multidrug resistant isolates. There is a question why detecting rectal colonized patients with EPE, CRA, and CP is so important. The research and the data showed that nearly 10% of patients with positive CPE rectal carriage are later positive in clinical sample. From this 10%, 85% being through infection, and uh, 11 days median time intervals between positive rectal screen and, and positive clinical sample specimen. 
because of this uh, important of uh, this, uh, uh, we have conducted several studies in this regard in community and clinical setting in Iran. One of them was detection of ESVL EP carriers in community and clinical setting, and the other uh, is uh, was detection of CRE and CP carriers in hospital. The, it, uh, it was conducted several studies, but two of the important of this and data of these two uh, uh, studies I show to you. Uh, totally from 120 rectal swabs were randomly collected from ICU patients and outpatients. Uh, from this, uh, 61 from inpatients and uh, 59 from outpatient samples we get. 60% of static individuals, including uh, 40 of outpatients and 22 of inpatients were carrier of ESVL EC and it's very uh, interesting for us. Uh, this is the, the data from this uh, study about, uh, as you see, uh, 72 of uh, the samples were ESBL positive in, uh, from rectal swabs and 22 clefsil lung pneumonia uh, isolated and 72 E. coli were isolated from um, rectal swab of this uh, uh, person. Uh, all of the clepsil lung pneumonia uh, that were uh, cephalosidium resistant uh, in the carrier isolates were also ESPL positive, but uh, 84 of cephotoxin resistance carrier isolates uh, from uh, 84, 72 of them were ESPL positive. Our data showed that some of the samples, some of the patients uh, colonized with two or three um, bacterial species. Six patients of, uh, in our uh, study, six, uh, six patients had colonized with uh, two of uh, species. Among 72 ESPL is the uh, 40, 34 were uh, virulent filogroups, including B2, F, and D. And uh, uh, common cell filogroups like A and C were detected in uh, 22 of isolates, and it's very uh, high. Uh, this uh, showed the uh, virulent ESPL EC isolates and common cell filogroups that were detected in uh, um, rectal swab of. Uh, ICU patient and community. Uh, also for coronary relatedness of this uh, isolate, we do MLST uh, for coronary relatedness and uh, detected the um, ST of this uh, isolate. In the present study, Four out of five isolate with conjugated plus meat were isolated from outpatients. And it's a uh, presence of ESPL EC isolate with putative virulent filogroups, conjugated plus meat, and high antimicrobial resistance in symptomatic fecal carriage, particularly in outpatients, because the uh, four of uh, five isolates were isolated from outpatients would be critical public health problem as they could easily lead to dissemination in community. From recall swab of uh, inpatient and outpatient, we isolated uh, 22 Krebsian law pneumonia. Uh, 10 uh, of this isolate uh, were uh, isolated from outpatients and uh, 60 of them uh, isolated from inpatients of ICU and also for coronary relatedness and uh, detection of uh, ST of this isolate, we uh, perform MLSD uh, technique for uh, this and the related uh, coronary relatedness with, uh, be detected. The other study uh, conducted on CRE and CPE carriers in hospital. This study uh, performed in the two hospitals in Tehran and Spahn. 
95 records swab were collected uh, from ICU patients at uh, to Iranian University Hospital. The rate of carriage of CR in hospitalized patients was uh, about uh, 38%. Overall, 54 CRE isolates were identified, of which uh, 47 were carbopenemous producer, that it is very high uh, percentage, and 15 patients were colonized by multiple CRE isolates. In our study, the carriage rate of CRE was high, and the emergency of CP isolates among patients is alarming. The implementation of adequate preventive measures such as active surveillance is urgently needed to control the spread of CP in the healthcare setting. Uh, as you see, uh, uh, we get uh, 95 sample record swap from uh, two hospitals and uh, six, uh, 36 uh, CRE isolated from inpatient. Uh, but from these 36 uh, outpatients, we isolated for, uh, 54 uh, isolates. It means that um, several of uh, patients uh, was, uh, were colonized with two or three uh, MDR isolates. Also, we exam for the Bello uh, genes. Uh, in this uh, isolate blood, cytexin was the, the more uh, belogenes that in this uh, sample. Also, the search for uh, risk factor in uh, the patients, three significant detected risk factors for, uh, for CRE carriage were in intensive care unit, uh, antibiotic exposure, and mechanical ventilation. Here, uh, I describe a patient uh, with uh, gastrointestinal colonization with three different NDM1 producing intrabacterial species that isolated from an inpatient in Tehran, Iran. It was a 28-year-old uh, female that uh, was admitted on uh, 7 July at uh, 2015. Uh, about two years ago, uh, he, she had an accident and uh, she came back to the uh, hospital for surgical repair of the skull. She uh, received the combination of vancomycin uh, plus uh, ceftazidim as pre-neurosurgical prophylaxis on uh, July, 24 of July, and uh, uh, four days after surgery, she presented fe with fever, and uh, for which lumbar puncture bed was performed. During the um, hospitalization in ICU, uh, we get rectal swab from uh, this patient and three different enterobacterial species uh, isolated from this patient, E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and enterobacterial cholera. Uh, the patient was, uh, was characterized by intestinal carriage with multiple below ndm one producing species during hospitalization. As I told, the uh, three species were isolated, and all of these uh, isolated uh, barbed uh, below ndm one genes. We searched for uh, conjugation of plasmids, and uh, also um, plasmid replicantyping. Uh, we uh, Perform for this. This is the data of this uh, patient. These uh, three isolates were resistant to all of antibiotics and also gentamicin, but uh, they were uh, sensitive to cholestin. Uh, and uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae and Escherichia uh, coli had. Uh, uh, Below uh, the, the NDM1, um, especially Klebsiella pneumoniae, below NDM1, and below SHV, and also pneumonal resistance genes. Uh, also, we um, uh, performed conjugation 
for uh, Enterobacter cloaca. Uh, interestingly, uh, Enterobacter cloaca plus meets uh, was uh, conjugated and transferred meropenem and genhomycin amicacin resistance to the to, uh, recipient cell. Uh, uh, and uh, we detect uh, the plasmid in compatibility test for uh, them. Uh, they were they were ink F2 and ink AC. Detection of below NDM1 on ink F2 and ink AC plasmid is alarming because these plasmids have been linked to the worldwide spread of below NDM1. Since the below NDM1 gene is transferred to bioconjugation plus meat, enterobacteria say have potential for transferring these genes among and between bacterial species in the gastrointestinal tract. And dissemination of carbopenemas producing Klebsiella pneumonia with multiple resistance causes a therapeutic challenge to clinicians owing to limited treatment options. The major a conclusion is that in order to implementation of effective infection control program, detection of fecal carriage in appropriate time, typically at the beginning of admission to the hospital is recommended. And this is needs the collaboration between the laboratory and the physician for uh, rapid diagnosis of these patients. And a screening for CRE and ESBLPE intestinal carriage and isolation of these persons are important for thwarting the development of antimicrobial resistance in, in clinical setting and community. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, is there any question? Uh, here we uh, connect to uh, Dr. Kalim and we, we have Dear Doctor, we connect to you. Would you please continue your, your lecture? Yes, sure. Sorry, I got disconnected. Other because uh, we are having a sort of windstorm over here, so my connection got lost. So I hope now it doesn't happen again. Uh, let's start. So let me start with screen sharing. And uh, I don't know till when you were all able to hear me. Can you please guide me a little till when you were all able to hear me? Was it yeah. till this slide? No, no, no. The other one. Oh, okay. Should I start from uh, here? Was I over here? Were you able to hear me till this? The other. Uh... Yes. Okay, so let me start again from here. I don't know uh, why this happened. It usually doesn't happen, but uh, we're unfortunate that my connection was lost today. Uh, but let's start. We were talking about, I was talking, basically I was telling about chloramphenicol uh, and about the typhoidal salmonella. Uh, I was telling you about that. We have uh, experienced this in our microbiological lab as well as in our clinics that first we were having obviously uh, chloramphenicol, ampicillin, as well as trimethropam sulfamethoxazole uh, uh, isolates, which are susceptible to all these drugs. And those were considered as first line treatment of typhoidal salmonella. But later on, MDR typhoidal salmonella appeared and all three of these drugs were rendered ineffective. At that time, fluoroquine alone came to our rescue. And we started using ciprofloxacin for this kind of salmonella. And for a long time, ciprofloxacin was considered a wonder drug for treating typhoid fever. 
but suddenly it was turned ineffective and then we started using third generation cephalosporins like ceftriaxone, cefixime and after some time we started having isolates which were resistant to even these third generation cephalosporins. We were very worried. We started using erythro, uh, azithromycin as well as carbapenems, injectable carbapenems for treating these multi-drug resistant as well as extremely drug resistant typhoidal salmonella. But in our lab, we started to see that these XDR typhoidal salmonella were now in vitro sensitive to chloramphenicol. Most of them were. It was very surprising for us because when we stopped using chloramphenicol, bacteria were very smart to shed off all the resistant mechanisms which were involved for producing resistance to chloramphenicol. And because they thought, what's the use of carrying this load when it's not required now? So they thought that we have stopped using chloramphenicol, so there is no use of keeping those resistance mechanisms with us. So they shed those all resistant mechanisms. And we didn't get an idea that this could have happened. And now when we saw this in vitro sensitivity pattern, we started giving chloramphenicol to the typhoidal patients in our clinics. And somehow they responded. Only five minutes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I would like, so this was about the story of chloramphenicol. So this is the same case with cholestin. Cholestin is very active against ESBLs and carbapenemase producing enterobacterials, pseudomonas, NSC, and tubacter bominae. And even if they appear resistant or intermediate to us on in vitro susceptibility, we can, if we give them in combination in our ICUs, they somehow prove effective. This is very interesting. And same is the case with uh, Dr. Christian has already talked about temocillin, so I will not uh, emphasize much on temocillin. This is now as it fell into disuse, right? But now when we see in vitro activities of this temocillin, we had carried out studies in our um, microbiology lab that this temocillin is somehow very much effective against ESBLs and even AMC producers, right? So we should start using these older and forgotten antibiotics to just to uh, get rid of these multi-drug resistant bacteria. This is the same case with the rifampicin and it has a very good synergistic effect with cholestin and meropenem against acinetobacter species. And this was also very astonishing was, uh, with us. And it has been uh, mentioned in many of the studies which have been carried out all over the world. So we should consider using all these older and forgotten antimicrobials. Phosphomycin is the same case. For phosphomycin, we have UTIs and it is showing very good in vitro as well as in vivo efficacy against all the enterobacterials which are causing urinary tract infections. And this is available as oral agent as well. So this is a very good option to use. And same is the case with mesilinam. It is even effective against carbapenemase producing organisms, though clinical data is relatively scarce. But the use of mesilinam for uncomplicated urinary tract infections has been endorsed by many international guidelines and experts. So in my view, we should look for better options. It's the time to talk has passed and it's time to act. We should not use our all research and development funds to just reinvent new drugs. We should use to evaluate efficacy of old and forgotten drugs in our setup because every setup is different. I have already talked about this before, that each and every region has a sort of slightly different antimicrobial pattern. So we should all evaluate these old and forgotten drugs in our own setups. And they must be have a optimized therapy. And secondly, early and appropriate empirical therapy with infection control practices is the main thing we should practice. So thank you so much for your time. And I'm sorry for the disruption which occurred during the presentation. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer. Is there any question? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. for your uh, 
uh, nice to speak. Thank you very much. And uh, we have the other uh, speaker, Dr. Farzad Badmasti from Pastor Institute of Iran. He's talking about the history of asymptobacter. He works on asymptobacter and have good data. Victor, could you please start your? Hello to everybody. Good afternoon. And uh, I would like uh, to thank to uh, Dr. Shacharaghi and Dr. Fezabadi, both of them of uh, tough guy and great guys. Uh, and uh, thank you very much that uh, you give me a great opportunity to share my thoughts about Ascentobacter bomani. Okay, uh, the story of Vasilitobacter boomania. Uh, maybe it's not a sweet uh, story, it's a bitter story. Uh, uh, we want to speak about it. Uh, as you know, antimicrobial resistance is recognized as a threat uh, to global health. There is a prediction that uh, show by 2050 uh, uh, maybe 10 million deaths occur across the world. It's more than the uh, current toll from the cancer, uh, the, as you see that. There is a horrible number. Uh, as you know, microbes have has always evolved uh, to resist the new drugs that are invented to fight against them. And we know there is an ongo ongoing combat uh, between humankind uh, and bacteria. I am afraid the antimicrobial resistant program does not merely detect a bunch of resistant gene. No, it's not. This is a part of surveillance uh, that uh, alarming the health si system to protect the patients. Now we have this problem, not only in hospital, but also uh, in the community. So we are facing with highly resistant bacteria as a causative agent of hospital acquired infection uh, or community acquired infection. Acinetobacter baumannia is one of the most important bacteria in uh, nosocomial infection. Why? Because this bacterium has uh, some capability which help uh, to, be, uh, to be a permanent guest uh, in clinical setting and uh, cause some difficult treatment infections. As you see, the first is uh, resistant to a broad range of antimicrobial agents. I mean, this bacterium has an insatiable appetite to collect resistant genes during horizontal gene transfer. For example, the genes of carbapenemases and uh, aminoglycoside modifying enzymes. It seems that this bacterium find a way to resist antibiotics and at any cost. Second is surviving on the minimal nutrient sources. I mean, this bacterium does not belong to fastidious bacteria and it could grow easily everywhere. Maybe on the skin, maybe on the sinks, walls, outdoors, indoors, everywhere. Uh, as you know, the main source of uh, Acinetobacter species in the, is in the soil. Uh, third is resistant to a hostile environment. I mean, this bacterium can develop bio, biofilm and biotics and abiotic surfaces uh, and generate a, a kind of pellicle. The last but not least is various uh, pathogenic mechanisms. For example, this bacterium has a versatile iron acquisition system that it could easily resist in the bloodstream infection of the host. Please don't get me wrong, other bacteria like uh, Pseudomonas aerogenosa, Staphylococcus aureus, E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, uh, has such capability, but this bacterium, as I told, uh, uh, has a high capability for capturing uh, antimicrobial resistant genes. As you see in this slide, there are four major groups which are prone to a bovine infection. 
The first one is immunocompromised and elderly people uh, who have underlying disease. Uh, the first, the second one is uh, premature babies. And the third is burn patient and uh, for wounded soldier. Uh, guess what? Uh, all of them have common condition. Yeah. Uh, lung hosp hospitalization is one of the most important risk factor for getting a bone infection. Uh, in the hospital, we have three major uh, a bone infection, uh, maybe ventilator associated pneumonia due to intubation um, for a long time or, or uh, catheter real, uh, related bloodstream infection uh, and uh, the last one is uh, wound infection due to surgery. VAB mostly has high morbidity and mortality and can occur in severe patients who experience tracheostomy or intubations. Wound infection can occur in soldiers who are injured during war. So due to availability of this bacterium in hospital, transmission by hand stuff and more important issues, I mean antimicrobial resistance, and finally, failure of treatment, unfortunately, we have many deaths among these patients. Uh, sorry, this is a repetition of slide. Based on MIC and uh, this diffusion methods, uh, the researcher in Iran have shown MDR and uh, carbapenem resistant abomani isolate uh, are a serious problem in this country. I'm not fully aware about other countries, but in Iran, it seems that carbapenem, carbapenems are not a good choice for curation of abomani infection anymore. However, I know resistance profile hospital by hospital or region by region in Iran maybe are different. In my opinion, we should consider effective procedure like antimicrobial stewardship, combination therapy and applied new drug and so on. Based on CDC announcement, as you know, um, carbapenem resistant acinetobacter strain uh, are the top urgent antibiotics resistant threat that need uh, worldwide surveillance uh, and infection control program. We desperately need um, to update our information about antimicrobial resistance among the nosocomial bacteria like Acinetobacter bovine. As you see, this study, these two studies show we have a high um, prevalence of MDR as in bacter bovine. Maybe an study showed that the pool prevalence of a, um, MDR uh, a bovine was estimated 72 uh, percent. And one meta-analysis revealed that 74% uh, were MDR or uh, 55 of abomani were resistant to amipenem. That's a horrible number. Colonel relatedness among abomani can help us for a better understanding how this clone emerge on or, uh, and spread. Moreover, we can detect the main sources of bacteria or how um, able money sneak into the hospital. If we, uh, if we emerge uh, the data of resistance with colonality, then we can understand what creature we are facing. Maybe uh, we can characterize the sequence types which are resistant to many antibiotics. As you know, multi leukocyte sequence typing is one of the most frequently uh, used methods for characterization of molecular epidemiology of abomani. I believe uh, MLSC is a good typing method because uh, we can easily compare our data to worldwide data. This is an uh, MST uh, minimum spanning tree of uh, the uh, some uh, sequence type, uh, pa uh, pastor sequence type that isolated from Middle East countries. This is an example. In this systematic review, we collected our sequence type, which have been reported in the Middle East countries. Uh, as you see, uh, sequence type 
uh, two uh, and sequence, sequence type one and uh, sequence type uh, 25 and sequence type uh, uh, 15 reported from different countries. These highly prevalent sequence types were mostly resistant to many antibiotics. Tracking of the circulation of resistant sequence type in a country or in a region is difficult, but we detected a little data that uh, Saudi Arabia and Egypt as highly visited countries in the Middle East are the sources for emerging uh, and the spreading of resistance sequence types in this region. I don't claim this study is per 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 perfect, not, no. Uh, but uh, we should find a way for hindering uh, the spreading of these resistant clones. This is a story about a university teaching hospital in Iran, uh, and we focused uh, uh, our resistant data on colonial relatedness and got an interesting lesson. First, we detected a highly prevalent MDR and uh, carbapenem resistant strain. This uh, resistant strain had three limited sequence type like 10, 2, and 3. Unfortunately, we found there is no continuous uh, infection control and a lot of carbapenem prescription were done in this, in this hospital. That's why we detected this data. We informed uh, the infection control team of hospital immediately. Uh, and uh, this is uh, my viewpoint about uh, Asintobacter bowman in Iran, uh, how our, I don't claim any, any things. Maybe some of my colleagues have different idea and it will be welcome. According to systematic reviews and our investigation, a Bowman clinical isolate are highly resistant to carbapenems and they are mostly MDR. There are moderate susceptible to ampicillin sulbactam, minocycline, and anti pseudomonas compound. And uh, most of them are susceptible to colicin. The reports uh, have demonstrated that the VIM gene is widespread in the Middle East region among carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter bomani. On the other hand, the combination of uh, uh, insertion sequence ABOMANI1 and uh, BLAUGZA 23 like is the most prevalent in this region. Uh, it seems that the main mechanism of uh, carbapenem resistance in ABOMANI are the cooperation of uh, BLAVIM, BLAUGZA 23 like, and possibly uh, RND efflux pump. As I told, the colonial structure of ABOMANI may be different hospital by hospital or region by region. Iran is a bigger country and um, uh, can detect a, a various sequence type. However, sequence type 2, 1, and 3 are uh, most prevalent in Iran. These sequence types are um, prevalent uh, worldwide. Uh, two. On the other hand, uh, some singleton clones appear or disappeared in different times and uh, region. In Iran, Abomani has many different arrangements of resistant gene cassette and class one uh, integrons. These mobile genetic elements are a repertoire of uh, um, uh, aminoglycoside modifying enzymes. Moreover, there are uh, some large conjugative plasmids uh, among resistant strains that uh, spread a resistant gene easily, uh, maybe, uh, in, um, maybe this event happened in God or environment. You know, uh, bacteria uh, always find a way to resist or escape from antimicrobial agents. This is a continuous story. Uh, so we uh, need new compound or new strategies against resistant bacteria. This is a table uh, including- Three minutes, three minutes, thanks. 
The time is over. Three minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Sorry, I have uh, more uh, the, uh, slides than that. Could you please uh, present it or not? Uh, last control. You have only uh, five minutes. Okay, okay. That's five. great. That's that's great. That's great. Okay, this is a table in cloud new option for treatment of carbapenem resistant acinetobacter Baumannia strain. Some of them uh, stay in cl a clinical fast to treat like cefidrocol, as uh, Dr. Joseph Anne mentioned it. Uh, and uh, it's a kind of cedromycin, uh, or maybe bacteriophage therapy, which have a pr promising prospect. As you see, uh, erbacycline is a FDA approved uh, tetracycline antibiotics. Uh, it's closely related to tigicycline. It has a broad spectrum of activity, including many multi drug resistant gram positive and gram negative bacteria. However, the other option like vaccination, monoclonal antibodies for the dynamic therapy, gallium nitride, antimicrobial peptides, and nanosilver particles uh, and neosome uh, are uh, option that we can consider uh, uh, all of them. This graph is a result of our study to detect surface exposed protein as putative vaccine candidates uh, in this study, we considered uh, 33 genomes of a Bowman strain and selected the outer membrane protein and secreted protein as a putative vaccine candidate using a reverse vaccinology method. Uh, finally, we proposed 11 protein as promising va vaccine candidate. This target belonged to protein involved in cell division like uh, NLPD, uh, and Fimberia or uh, Pili assembly, uh, the, maybe the protein uh, uh, green in green color. And some protein involving iron acquisition system, the protein is in blue uh, color. Uh, moreover, we detected some other protein uh, in this study, this uh, purpose protein have two important characteristics. They are very conserved and available in, in the widespread sequence types. If I uh, have enough time, I, uh, I would like to continue this, my presentation. Uh, and if not, it's over. I have no voice, sorry. Uh, because we have the other speaker, would you please finish your? Okay, why not? Thank you very much. Thanks, thank you very much, Dr. Badmasti. It was a very nice uh, lecture. Thank you. Do you have any question, audience? No, thank you very much. Thank you all. Dr. Alavi, would you please ask your question? Yes, thank you. Did you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. Hi, uh, dear Farzad Badbasti, and thank you for your best presentation. You're welcome. Okay. In, in attention with uh, your experiences and studies, uh, in your opinion, uh, use of uh, combined antibacterial uh, how much effective uh, to prevention of antibacterial resistance for this uh, species uh, bacteria in comparison with single antibiotic therapy? And is uh, this necessary uh, that we use uh, combined antibiotic for uh, treatment this um, infection or not? Thank you very much for your great uh, question. Yes, in my opinion, the combination therapy is a key, is an important thing. Uh, we should uh, uh, 
we should uh, this, uh, we should do our surveillance in the hospital very properly and in a continuous way, not uh, the districtly. In a continuous way, we should uh, the, do our surveillance uh, and uh, monitor our uh, carbapenem resistant maybe uh, acinetobacter bomani strain. Yes, there is a uh, great option like uh, ampicillin sulbactams and like uh, uh, newly currently minocyclines or cholestine. We can uh, use it in a combination way. Why not? It's very effective method in my opinion. One of, the, one of the strategies for uh, prevention of increasing of antibacterials, not only in acinus bacter bomani, but in all the PCR uh, gram-negative bacteria, uh, such as acinus bacter bomani, um, pseudomonas originosa, clepsilla nomoni, and the other uh, Gramnic epibacilla is combination therapy is the best one of the best uh, uh, treatment. Thanks. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you very much. The other uh, speaker is uh, Doctor Big Verdi from Tehran University in Medical Sciences. Dear Doctor, do uh, are you present? He's present. Yes. Would you please connect to him? We don't have no... Would you please uh, turn on your uh, room? Okay. Hmm. I open it. We don't have any picture from you. Uh -huh. Please start your uh, lecture. We don't have any uh, picture from him. Okay. Victor, please start your. In the name of God. Hello, everyone. The title of my presentation is Antimicrobial Resistance in Gram Positive Coxi in Iran. Gram-positive cocci, like staphylococci and enterococci, are extremely important pathogens in the hospital environment. Methicillin-resistant staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA, and vancomycin-resistant enterococci, or VRE, are extremely important pathogens in the hospital environment. They are common cause of bloodstream and other infection in hospitalized patient. MRSA and VRE are of particular concern in Iran. All MRSA strain carry a mobile genetic element called a staphylococcal cassette chromosome which harbors MECA-A gene. SSE-MEC is the defining feature of MRSA strains and is responsible for conferring the both spectrum beta-lactam resistance. The high diversity in the structure organization and the genetic content of SSE-MEC has resulted in the classification into type and subtype. Today, today, 13 distinct type of SSMEC have been identified in MRSA strain. MECA A encodes an alternative penicillin binding protein, penicillin binding to A, that has low affinity for most semi-synthetic penicillins, including methicillin, nephicillin, and oxacillin, as well as most CFM agents. Unlike penicillin as mediated resistance, resistance by MECA A is port spectrum, conferring resistance to entire classes of 
beta-lactam drugs except for ceftarolin and ceftobiprol. According to according to published studies from Iran between 2000 to 2020, the prevalence of hospital acquired MRSA varies considerably from 10 to 70 percent in various Iranian hospitals, and the mean rate of MRSA is 53 percent. The highest rate are reported in Tehran, Mashhad, Ilam, Khurramabad, and Sananaj. More than 70% of hospital acquired MRSA strain belong to SSMH type 3. Rare isolate have been reported to carry SSMH type 1 and 2. Few data exist regarding the colonal characterization of hospital acquired MRSA isolate from Iran. However, studies that exist have shown that the majority of hospital acquired MRSA strain have emerged from two Staphylococcus aureus colonal complex, CC5 and CC58, as defined by MLST. Vancomycin resistant in Staphylococcus aureus. Vancomycin become a therapeutic agent for the treatment of serious infection caused by MRSA in the late 1980. Almost at the same time, vancomycin resistant enterococci were first identified in Europe and quickly become endemic in hospital intensive care units. Vancomycin resistance in VRE was mediated by transposon, mainly found on plasmid, which raised considerable concern about the risk of dissemination of vancomycin resistance determinants to universally susceptible organisms of medical importance, especially Staphylococcus aureus. This concern was subsequently confirmed by the successful transfer of van element from Enterococcus fecalis to a MRSA a strain in mixed infected mice. The isolate of a Staphylococcus aureus with reduce to vancomycin are classified into three groups by CLSI. They are vancomycin susceptible Staphylococcus aureus, vancomycin susceptible Staphylococcus aureus with MIC lower than two microgram per ml, vancomycin intermediate, Staphylococcus aureus or VISA with MIC of 4 to 8 microgram per ml and VRS of with MIC higher than 16 microgram per ml. Vancomycin resistance in Staphylococcus aureus is mediated by Vangene A cluster. In conferring whether an isolate belongs to VRS or the presence of van A or other van resistant determinants should be demonstrated by molecular methods such as PCR. In 2002, the first VRS of strain was recovered in Michigan of USA. In the same year, the second VRSA strain was isolated in Pennsylvania. Since then, a total of 52, 52 VRSA strains carrying one genes have been reported, including 11 isolated in Iran. The distribution of VRSA in Iran. Seven VRSA strains reported from Tehran, 
two from Kerman and one from Mashhad and one from Gilan. We are as isolates are susceptible to multiple antibiotics, which may antibacterial therapy an effective option in the clinical treatment of VRSA infections. Doptomycin and linozolide are two commonly selected antibiotics for VRSA infections treatment. It was reported that more than 90% of VRSA isolates were susceptible to doptomycin and linozolide. Therefore, a systematic antimicrobial therapy with effective antibiotics is generally implanted upon VRSA isolation determination by a clinical laboratory. To date, there is no report about doptomycin or linozolite resistance in Staphylococcus aureus isolate from Iran. Most clinical infections of enterococci are caused by enterococcus fecalis and enterococcus facium, with enterococcus fecalis being the most prevalent. Enterococci are not as virulent as Staphylococcus aureus, but they are intrinsically resistant to many antibiotics and have acquired resistance to virtually all antimicrobials, including vancomycin. Vancomycin resistance is classified into several gene clusters based on DNA sequence of the ligas van gene homologs that encode the key enzyme for the synthetize of D-alanine elected and D-alanine deserin. At least, at least 11 vane A gene cluster that confer resistance, that confer vancomycin resistance, responding for vane A, vane B, D, F, I, M, vane C, E, G, L, and vane N, tenotype have been described to date. The genes, the gene that encode, the gene that encode D-alanine, d, -alanine, d -alanine, ligase, such as vane A, D, D, F, I, and M, often result in high level vancomycin resistance, you can see. Why the gene encode D-alanine, d, -alanine, d including vane C, vane E, G, L, and N, generally result in low level, low level resistance, MIC of 8 to 16 microgram per ml. According to published data from Iran, the prevalence of VRE varies from 3 to 20 percent in various Iranian hospital and the mean rate of VRE is 9 percent. Summary. Antimicrobial resistance among gram-positive cocci presents a challenge to clinician treating nosocomical acquired infections. Although the case's number of VRSA infection is limited. VRSA is still a potential threat to public health. Intensive surveillance of vancomycin resistant, proper use of antibiotics, and adherence to infection control guidelines in healthcare settings are essential for preventing emergence and dissemination of VRSA strains. Thank you very much. Dear Doctor, thank you very much uh, for your uh, presentation. And uh, I thanks from all the uh, audience and the lecturer for uh, participating in this uh, webinar. 
and I hope that this uh, panel was uh, useful for all of us. Thank Do you have any question and other other comments? This do you have? Uh, we have the other panel in 8th of September. Uh, uh, the panel is about vaccine, yes. Vaccine, yes. And 9th of September and uh, 9th of September about uh, zoonosis. Thank you very much for all and have a good day. Goodbye. Thank you very much.